Agnac of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, we have consideration of late additions to the agenda and additions or deletions to the consent and regular agendas. Uh, Mr. Palacios. Uh, yes, we have a, a few uh, corrections on the regular agenda. Item number 11, uh, staff requests that this item be deleted. This is packet pages 96 through 103. And then on the consent agenda, item 33, there's additional materials a revised memo, replacement packet pages 214 through 216. There's also a revised attachment A, replaced replacement packet pages 217 through 219. That concludes the corrections, Chair. Okay, thank you. Are there any announcements by the board member by board members of items removed from the consent to uh, the regular agenda? I think so. There, uh, I, yes. would like, I would yes. like to ask that we remove uh, item 25, to the regular agenda concerning the uh, conduct of our meetings digitally. I just like to ultimately to propose one small change to that. Um, and I'd also like to ask that we remove item 54 from the consent to the regular agenda. Uh, that's concerning the spending of $8 million on rapid rehousing um, using state and federal grants that we have, uh, are accepting today. Okay, so then, um... You just wanted to comment on 25, did you, did you say, excuse me? Uh, yes, just had a, a small amendment to propose to 25. Okay, I think we can do that in the consent agenda, probably on number item uh, 54, we should have that become uh, uh, number, uh, item number 13A, that'd be correct. So number, uh, item number 54 on the consent agenda will become item number 13A, um, the last item on our regular agenda. And uh, do you wanna make a, a brief comment on, on the other at this point? I'm sure, happy to do that. Um, the item number 25 um, concerning virtual board meetings, it says that we would continue to conduct all board of supervisors public meetings using the all virtual model until the governor lifts the Brown Act exemptions due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, I just believe that that triggering time might be a little bit late in reviewing executive order N2920, which does change, uh, which, which relieves us of these Brown Act obligations. Um, it says that those will be in place until social, social distancing, um, so, so long as social distancing is, is recommended even not simply required. I do think that uh, we could be recommending social distancing for some time. So I would like to propose an amendment that uh, that we change that to until such time as the County of Santa Cruz meets all health metrics so as to be better than the state defined minimal or yellow tier risk level. Okay, um, any comments by board members or Mr. Palacios? Um, uh, just a point of order real quick from County Council. Um, yeah. Given that we haven't actually taken public comment on this thing, I, I don't know that we could really be amending um, an item at this point. So I, I don't feel it proper for me to be providing additional comments on this item until we've gone to the public. I, I respect the fact that that's how it was directed towards Supervisor Koenig, but I think that um, this should be at a different time. Is that a correct? Yeah, I, yeah, I appreciate that that point of order. Right now uh, is just for pulling items from consent to the regular agenda if we want to do that, um, and uh, and then we could uh, make this item either 13B uh, or um, not remove it, or the board could decide not to remove it to the consent uh, to the to the regular agenda. And, and I don't think it needs to be removed. I think that somebody can make an amendment as we are always do to consent as uh, the chair was saying, and, and that obviously Supervisor Koenig will be making that amendment. I just, uh, I will have comments on, on that amendment at the time. I just wanted to be sure that we had an opportunity for the community to address it before we formally tried to amend okay. an item. That, that's right. So, so what, we, what we could do right now is just um, postpone further comment on the item until, uh, until the, the board is giving comments on the consent agenda. Very well, okay, so we, we will um, 
Okay, so uh, then for number four, is there any other um, items to be removed from the consent of regular agenda? Any board members? Seeing that we will go to public comment and then address that issue we just were commenting on. Uh, this is the time for public comment and any person may address the board once during a public comment period, not exceeding two minutes. Uh, comments must be directed to items on today's consent or closed session agendas, yet to be heard items on the regular agenda or on a topic not on today's agenda, but within jurisdiction of the board. Uh, we'll take uh, comments now for up to 30 minutes, and if necessary, additional time for public comments will be allowed after the last item on today's regular agenda. Do we, uh, do we have any uh, comments from the public? Yes, Chair, we do. We currently have seven members of the public with their hand raised. For those joining us via the Zoom link, a reminder that the hand raising feature is at the bottom of your screen. If you're dialing in, please press star nine to raise your hand to be placed in the queue. As the chair said, you will have two minutes to speak and you will be muted automatically at the end of this time. Caller 3256, your microphone is available. Please unmute. Good morning, this is Ellie Black. Am I being heard? Yes. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, first off, I would like to thank you for mentioning the instructions for the public to contact during public comment. I would like to make a small request that the phone number be repeated um, during that announcement. And also that at the time of the phone number being uh, mentioned that also the codes to raise the hand and the codes to unmute are also mentioned at that time. We do need to remember that many of the people of the public who are trying to make public comment are people who are the elders and wise people in our community for a large part and many of them do not have uh, computers and may not have a lot of the technical experience that others use every day. And I think it's only fair to accommodate everyone as much as possible in that way. And because really the folks who don't have computers but still are paying attention to everything that's going on and have seen the history of this of this county through the years and through the decades, their input is some of the most valuable that we can hear. So thank you for everything you're doing. Hopefully we will be able to see you all face to face again. I'd like to uh, thank Supervisor Koenig for mentioning item number 25 on the consent agenda. This is something that obviously to me anyway, should be something that is pulled off the consent agenda so that it can be discussed further. Uh, in all of the months during this uh, pandemic situation, as far as I know, no one became ill or infected as a result of the public meetings, uh, to my knowledge, if that's different, let me know, but I believe that there has been no super spreader event of any type resulting from those meetings. So those in-person meetings really should be resumed. Thank you, caller user one. Your microphone is available. Good morning, board. Uh, my name is Diana Nickel, and um, as you may know, um, the cellular industry has plans to install 5G antennas in residential neighborhoods every five to seven houses over the next few years. Cities, including Mill Valley, California, have successfully passed laws to ban installation from residential neighborhoods. I'd like this board to pass that law, same law. Here's Dr. Martin Paul. He is a professor emeritus, emeritus of biochemistry and basic medical science at Washington State University discussing 5G. What I've been doing most recently is I, I, in my talks, I first of all start talking about eight different types of facts which are extraordinarily well documented based on anywhere from 13 to 35 different published sure. reviews that show that they're occurring following uh, EMF exposures. Now, those include 
include widespread neurological and neuropsychiatric effects, which are becoming increasingly common in all of the technologically advanced countries on Earth. They include reproductive effects, lowered male and female reproduction, increased spontaneous abortion, decreased levels of each of the three types of sex hormones, and lowered libido. And all of those things are going on. In terms of male fertility, there are multiple types of effects that impact male fertility. So we have those. We have oxidative stress, which is involved in essentially every chronic disease you can name as a, as a major causal element. We have attacks on the cellular DNA, the DNA of our cells, of three different types, of which are involved in producing the, the most important types of mutations that we have in human genetics, but also in terms of the most important changes that occur to produce cancer. And we have also increased levels of what's called apoptosis, often also pronounced apoptosis, which is programmed cell death, which is uh, something that's very... 1999, your microphone is unmuted. Uh, color 1999, uh, unmute, please. Um, guess we're going go to the next caller. Caller 1192, your microphone is unmuted. Muted. Caller eleven ninety two. I think we can hear you trying to speak. Okay. Good morning. My name is James. Hume. We lost you, Mr. Ewing. Okay, hey, we lost this caller. Caller 1192, your microphone is available. Um, Caller 1192, your microphone is unmuted. Hi, this is Gail Nakunam, and I want to just say that this 5G is going to be very unwelcome in people's communities. It's, um, it's very dense coverage of radiation, and the health effects are going to be disastrous. So I really recommend against that. Also, the um, Waiving the Brown Act because someone recommends it, medical or not, is legislating by medical people, authorities. You may not legislate away our rights. Just because it's recommended by somebody who's unaccountable and is not approving why is gonna to lead to more secrecy of our government. The Brown Act is to prevent secrecy and to prevent people being excluded from the legislative process and the decisions being made. We need less secrecy. Thanks. Have a great day. Carol, your microphone is unmuted. I'd like to speak on item 25. Also, um, I wanna thank um, Supervisor Koenig for um, this amendment. Um, I would also support uh, removing it from the consent agenda and, and voting on it. Um, the Orange County Board of Supervisors is meeting in person. I'm not sure why our county Board of Supervisors is not meeting in person. 
And the population of Orange County is more than 3 million and our population is quite a bit less than that. I think the risk of any contraction of any infectious disease is quite low in our county. So um, I would support um, going back to a hybrid model of in-person and, um, and virtual. As we can see, two of the people who've tried to call in today can't even get in and speak. Um, so I think that, that that point shows itself that we need to have um, in-person meetings and I hope you'll please take all that into account. Um, next, I'd like to speak about the homeless encampment in the Gulch along North Rodeo Gulch. This encampment is on county owned land. Um, the people who live along North Rodeo Gulch have called the sheriff to report drug use and other criminal activity occurring in this encampment. However, the sheriff's office has failed to act. Allowing this criminal activity to continue in this encampment puts the law abiding people who live along North Rodeo Gulch at risk. Indeed, the people in this encampment started a fire on Sunday, which resulted in fire trucks being called and North Rodeo Gulch was closed. Further, the people who started this fire violated Santa Cruz County Code 7.92. Dot 305.4, which reads deliberate or negligent burning, it shall be unlawful to deliberately or through negligence set fire or cause the burning of combustible material in such a manner as to endanger the safety of persons or property. Please conduct a thorough investigation of this criminal activity and prosecute these people to the fullest extent of the law. Color 2915. Your microphone is unmuted. Good morning, this is Becky Steinbruner. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you, good morning. And I also want to uh, second the sentiments that our Board of Supervisor meetings need to return to the hybrid model, item number um, 25. It is, it is not true in the staff report that that no other meetings are being held in person with a hybrid. Central Fire is and always has throughout this, and there have been no problems. There are many people, such as myself, that can only participate via telephone. We are not able to see the presentations that your board receives via slides. Um, that is critical and will be imperative that we do see during budget, budget season. I would like to ask that you, um, and I did submit a letter to you, um, I would like to ask that you install some sort of um, screen or something in the basement or someplace within the county building such that a, a small group of people could, with masks, socially distancing, see those screens. You're um, omitting a lot of information for the public view, and I'd like that changed. I also want to speak to um, number 24, waterproofing 701 Ocean Street. I hope that there is landscaping provided when that waterproofing is done. Many large and very beautiful trees were cut down and um, the building sorely needs landscaping. So I hope that's part of item 24. I am, oh, I'm sorry, that's item 27. Um, I have been participating in the Board of Forestry meetings, and I'm happy to hear that Santa Cruz County officials have too. I heard J.M. Brown yesterday. The board did a vote to put that through to the administrative uh, law office with a 45-day comment. I'm very concerned about that. Gail Newell. Good morning, Board of Supervisors, others in attendance. Um, I want to speak to the proclamation proclaiming April 5 to 11, 2021 as National Public Health Week. At the next uh, meeting, uh, Board of Supervisors meeting, there will be a presentation from the Public Health Division. But in the meantime, I'd like to say a few words about National Public Health Week. During the first full week of April each year, the American Public Health Association brings together communities across the United States to observe National Public Health Week as a time to recognize the contributions of public health and highlight issues that are important to improving our nation's health. 
I want to thank Supervisor McPherson for the signed proclamation and for all of the Board of Supervisors recognizing National Public Health Week for the County of Santa Cruz. And the proclamation itself, I hope everyone has a chance to read it. It highlights many of our accomplishments in the past year, not just COVID, but those around uh, racism as a public health crisis, about the response to the CZU fire, and about addressing social determinants of health, acknowledging housing as health, and establishing the Housing for Health office this past year. I want to remind you as well that during our Save Lives campaign, we've slowed the spread, we've adapted to a new normal, we vaccinated, and now we're on the E, elevate the readiness for, for saving lives in Santa Cruz County. This means assuring a vibrant public health division and in reinvesting and uh, stopping the disinvestment um, in public health as has been the case every year for the past decade until the COVID crisis. Serge Kagno, your microphone is available. Who is this? Hi, my name is Serge Kagno. Um, I do a lot of work for the homeless and I am on the County Mental Health Advisory Board. Um, I'm only speaking for myself though. Um, I'm referring to number 53, which is the Salvation Army contract. Um, a very specific little piece within that, the Salvation Army um, is the only nonprofit that I know in Santa Cruz that does not have unemployment insurance. We're now in a pandemic. A lot of people are losing their jobs. These, this contract specifically is probably going to be a temporary thing. So a lot of people are going to be laid off at the end of this. Um, I would just ask the board to look into the possibility of requiring unemployment insurance as part of the contract. The Salvation Army actually does have unemployment in other states where they're required to do that. It's just California and Santa Cruz where they are not doing that. So sorry about that. That's my puppy. Um, and yeah, I would just, uh, I appreciate the contract and appreciate the service they, they give. Um, and uh, the living wage ordinance is something new that's signed for nonprofits. Uh, I hadn't noticed that before and I appreciate that. But just that one piece of unemployment insurance with the challenges that we're having of trying to keeping people housed and specifically non people who work nonprofits, the Human Care Alliance's nonprofit wage and benefit survey showed that uh, people who are working at the homeless shelters are among the lowest paid within our nonprofits. So this is just trying to take care of the people that take care of our most vulnerable people. Okay, hey, thank you very much. Caller 1965, your microphone is available. Caller 1965, you've unmuted yourself. Hello, good morning, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. I also would like to address item number 25 this morning. Um, I would like to thank Supervisor Koenig for bringing this up to pull it off of the consent agenda. And I echo all of the sentiments uh, that were brought, brought up by all the other callers and Zoom participants. My other concern with this that hasn't been mentioned is that since we've been all virtual, the web comments, the ability for folks to to participate via the web has been taken away with no, there hasn't even been any comments to that or it hasn't been spoken to by any of the supervisors involved. There's folks that are not able to join the meetings period, but would like to have their comments heard. Um, I also would like to say, as I'm waiting on hold or listening on hold, I would like to ask that if there was comments by public officials that that be put on the agenda officially so that those of us that are at work and waiting to speak aren't pushed further down the line. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew Weisner. Your microphone is available. 
Thank you very much and good morning to the Board of Supervisors and others in attendance. My name is Matthew Weisner. I'm the Directing Attorney at the Community Action Board's Santa Cruz Immigration Project. And I just wanted to join today to introduce myself and thank the board for their, their deliberate and thoughtful response to the COVID-19 pandemic and the efforts to prioritize public health <clears throat> and support vaccination rollout. And I just wanted to also remind the board and the public that our agency, the Community Action Board of Santa Cruz County, has continued to assist the public throughout this pandemic and the various shutdowns. We've been providing hybrid and remote services when necessary. And our program in particular, the Immigration Project, has continued to provide services throughout all these phases, including naturalization, family-based petitions, and DACA, and applications for permanent residency, among other legal services. So we are continuing to, to do our work and um, we serve residents of, of the county and, and beyond in, in pro bono services. And with that, I just wanted to thank you for your continued prioritization and support of the public health and vaccine rollout um, that will hopefully get us back to providing in-person services soon. Caller 1401, your microphone is available. Hi, this is Marilyn Garrett, and there are different public health threats, and a big one is the radiation from all the wireless microwave technology. But also, I want to quote from a program called Toward a Vaccine Disaster. It was on the highwire.com, and this is from international vaccine developer, Gert van den Bosch, who's from Belgium, works with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, interviewed by Dr. Philip McMillan. Here are some quotes. These vaccines don't prevent infections. These vaccines outcompete our natural antibodies. We have nonspecific antibodies. These are long-lived vaccine-induced antibodies. Basically, everyone getting a vaccine, that is a COVID shot, is having their innate immune system destroyed. This is a very, very serious problem. A steep incline in severe illness is inevitable. Check out the highwire.com about an hour and 20 minutes in. And then, uh, do you want to play this? A few more quotes from Dr. Martin Paul on the adverse documented effects from 5G and wireless exposure. And also, uh, the reproductive effects that we talked about before. And then there are also uh, many different hormonal effects. And then we have uh, 35 different published reviews showing that EMS. Caller 19999. Good morning. My name is James Ewing Whitman. It is March 23rd. I'm addressing the Board of Supervisors in Santa Cruz, California. Can I be heard? Yes. Yes. Excellent. I don't know what happened before. Uh, a question, you know, I was listening to the Pledges of Allegiance. I was thinking about it. Which American flag is the Pledge of Allegiance being um, stated in front of? The American flag before 1871 or the American flag with the gold fringe that represents USA Incorporated, where Washington, D.C. is the military branch of the triad, including the Vatican and the Red Shield Rothschilds Bank in London, but actually in Switzerland. I don't do Zoom, so I can't see which flag. Um, I, it's, it would be great to be able to meet in person, do the social distancing. I don't know what's really going to change. Um, I help provide some events for social connecting and social distancing. Um, you know, we're really thinking about doing an exploratory recall committee. Certainly this Thursday evening at Twin Lakes Beach, March 25th, we will be um, 
broadcasting part of these procedures and, mm-hmm. and other things as well. Um, if people want to social distance, they will probably be able to sit in their cars and from 200 yards away be able to clearly see what is being spoken here. Um, what's going on with what the previous callers have talked about? You know, there's a book called The Five Chimneys that um, a woman wrote who was the surgical assistant of her husband. She was in Auschwitz. She talked about what was going on with with um, experimenting on human beings, um, which was really determined to be illegal. But what's going on right now with these vaccinations? Um, changing the subject slightly, I found a very short three-page, reduced down the three-page article Thank you, Chair. There are no other speakers for public comment. Okay, thank you. And thank you for the input um, from the general public. Um, Just want to uh, go back to um, items number 25 and 54, which have been requested to be uh, put on the regular agenda. We previously said item 54 would be 13A. Uh, Mr. County Council, can we make 25 13A and 54 13B? Yes. You can do that. Okay, then I would uh, entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda with the recognition that item 25 regarding uh, virtual meetings uh, become 13A at the end of our regular agenda and item 54 uh, regarding emergency payment program services become 13B at the end of our uh, regular agenda. I would entertain a motion to that effect. Well, Mr. Chair, also uh, perhaps- I want to get com- comments from the board members too. I'm sorry, uh, we'll go ahead and get, are there any comments from the board members? Uh, I'll, I'll speak briefly to just an item on, and I appreciate that, Mr. Chair, on item uh, 59, just like to thank Public Works on their work on the Postumer, uh system project, septic system project. And, and also I look forward to their continued uh, partnership with the community out there. There still are a lot of outstanding questions that I know uh, I really do appreciate Mr. Edler uh, and Beatrice's work on this uh, to ensure that all those questions are addressed. But again, thanks to Public Works for their work out there and I appreciate their continued outreach on that item. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, my colleague, Supervisor Coonerty on bringing forward um, item 33. I'll let him speak more to it, but uh, clearly we're dealing with a a hate crime epidemic within our country right now. And um, I appreciate the work of of Supervisor Kundi bringing this item to my attention and also bringing this to the board's attention. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, Any other board members want to have comments on the consent agenda? Yes. Uh, I'll make a comment. Go Uh, ahead. uh, uh, Go ahead, Mr. Kundi, Supervisor Kundi. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just a couple items to comment on. First is, uh, as Supervisor Friend mentioned, he and I brought an item on 33, recognizing the uh, increase in anti-Asian both rhetoric and violence in this com- uh, country. And, um, you know, we're seeing more hate and more uh, conspiracies and then and then more victims. And so uh, this is, uh, we wanted to make a statement um, recognizing the significant Asian population and uh, history in our community um, that, uh, that that we recognize this this moment and will take steps to combat it. Um, I should also note uh, both in the violence last week in Atlanta than the violence yesterday uh, in Boulder, Colorado, uh, the continuing um, gun violence that that hits this country that's hit uh, our community that's hit. Uh, many people we know and our families, um, it's, it's senseless and um, painful, and uh, we continue to need real action to address um, gun violence in this country. I also want to talk about uh, item number 41. Um, this is about the neighborhood courts program. I think this is a great program. I attended one of the virtual town halls about it, and I want to thank probation and the DA and the sheriff for their work on this. I'd like to add direction that the board receive a report back on the program in one year, detailing the number of cases heard uh, uh, in the neighborhood courts, the types of crimes heard, if the defendants reoffended, and whether the victims and and defendants were satisfied with the process. I think 
think we can learn a lot from this program and, um, and uh, it'd be great to get a report back and hear how it's going. And then finally, I, uh, item number 49, which is to support for uh, kids and youth uh, who are either currently in foster care uh, or uh, out, out of foster care. Just wanna recognize the efforts that this, this county continues to take um, to help this uh, exceptionally vulnerable population. Um, and, uh, and I appreciate the efforts uh, of HSD to, um, to, to build support for, for these foster kids and their families. Thank you, uh, Supervisor Caput. Uh, thank you, Chairman McPherson. Uh, I just wanted to comment on uh, item number 61, uh, and that's uh, increasing the amount uh, for $32,000 for uh, additional engineering of the uh, uh, East Lake Avenue, which is State Route 152 and Houlihan Road. College Road project uh, were, were about a million dollars, 900 something thousand dollars short of being able to complete the work that needs to be done there. And uh, hopefully we'll get some grant money and hopefully we'll be able to get that uh, project uh, started and then finished. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, Mr. Koenig, you had made a comment already about one of the items, and do you have any other fur further comments about the uh, consent agenda? Uh, yes, Chair, just a few other comments. Um, on item 26, uh, the Gender and Justice Commission, um, I would like um, ultimately to, to propose an amendment to that um, in that uh, I see in the bylaws, the purpose and charter of that commission is not included, and I know um, for folks that the chairs of commissions is always helpful um, to be able to return to that uh, when, when directing a meeting so that everyone stays on task. Uh, I'm happy to propose that um, in a motion in a bit. On item 27, waterproofing of 701, uh, yeah, excited to see this as well. During the recent rainstorms, we saw water uh, leaking in through the bolts in my office, so that's definitely needed. Uh, item 33, I also wanna um, thank my colleagues for bringing this forward. Um, one of my, the analyst in, in my office is uh, her mother-in-law is Asian American, and recently someone threw a large rock uh, at her house. So it's it's this very real issue uh, in our community, and um, you know, divided we fall, united we stand. And I'm I'm excited and happy to support this item. Okay. Item 58, uh, Mish 3212 Mission Drive. I'm looking forward to the public hearing at our next meeting on this exciting infill project. Uh, from everything I've seen so far, it's a well-designed project. And it integrates the uh, provision of free transit passes for residents. So um, it's really uh, progressive in addressing traffic impacts. And then finally, item 63, uh, On uh, I'm just excited to see that we're putting Improvements to Laurel Road out to bid. We've we've had a lot of constituent uh, input on this. I um, uh, asking when this would be done. So happy to see it moving forward. That's all. Okay. Um, I'll make a couple of comments too. I just want to let you know that um, uh, my office uh, did make a comment before the California Board of Forestry, as was mentioned earlier. Uh, that's a really critical item for the future of those who want to rebuild in uh, the. Uh, mountainous areas that were impacted by the fires. On um, item number 39, the East Siani Road Repairs, uh, this is a, a ongoing effort by our Public Works Department. I wanna thank the department for um, continuing to work on storm dam damage repairs. Um, we appreciate uh, this uh, in our, my district, on District 5, and some others have mentioned that they have uh, had improvements in their districts as well. Uh, so with that, I think, um, I will entertain a motion to approve the agenda. The, uh, Pardon me, Chair. I do have a speaker to the consent agenda. Oh, excuse me. Go ahead. Um, I thought, excuse me. Um, oh, I'm we, sorry. We did take public comment that it's supposed to include the consent agenda uh, and public comment. Uh, we had, we've combined both, but if we miss somebody, I guess we can go ahead and make an exception, but in, in the in the future, what we've done is we've combined all public comment in general and on the consent agenda in that one public comment item. And we don't, haven't had public comments separately on consent. Thank you for the clarification. 
So if I think if we do have somebody who didn't, we didn't clarify that to, I guess we should go ahead and let them speak. I'm assuming uh, Chair McPherson, yeah. that's your pleasure. Sure. Is there anybody else that does want to speak at this point? Is that what your point is? They have one caller. Okay. Is that is that what you're you're referring to, Mr. Palacios? Yeah. Normally, okay. we don't have a separate uh, public comment on consent. Remember, we've changed that where we've combined all public comment with consent in that one item. But if some if there was a confusion, we can certainly make an exception for this one uh, speaker if you if that's what you'd prefer, Chair. Yeah. Okay. Let's have we'll, we'll allow this to speaker to uh, make a comment at this point. Then. Okay. Bigum, your microphone is available. Last call for L. Bigum. I'm here. Okay, go please. Go ahead. I, I'm not. I'm, I have nothing to say. I don't know why they're asking me to talk. I'm just here to listen. <laughs> hey, we do have an item coming up on. I think you might want to address. Okay, thank what? you both. Um, yeah. Okay, then we'll. Um, We'll go back to uh, entertaining a motion as uh, amended uh, for the um, consent agenda. I'll move the consent agenda as amended. This is Coonerty. Uh, point of information um, for county council. If the uh, charter were to be added to the uh, bylaws for the Gender and Justice Commission, would it have to come back before the board in order to be approved or, or could we approve it? Uh, well, Supervisor Koenig, um, there's a motion on the floor right now to accept the consent agenda without anything related to the Justice uh, and Gender Commission. Um, so traditionally, if there's a second to that motion, then the motion would be reviewed and, uh, and passed on. Um, to your point, one could make a motion right now to amend the bylaws to the Justice and Gender Commission if you had a very specific thing that you wanted to amend it to state and the board could entertain that motion. And it would not have to come back, in other words. However, I will go on to add that if it's something that the Justice and Gender Commission has not reviewed previously, traditionally, the board would want the Justice and Gender Commission to review any suggested change. So one idea might be for you to uh, 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 add language to send this back to the Justice and Gender Commission to review a change to their bylaws to include whatever it is that you're thinking of right now. Thank you. I'll, I'll second the motion, Chair. Okay, so the motion is to accept the uh, the consent agenda as amended. Uh, please call the roll. Thank you, and for one, one moment. I'll wait, wait. Go ahead. Oh, excuse me. Go ahead. I'd like to move to amend um, that we edit um, the bylaws for item 26 to include the charter that uh, send it back to the Gender and Justice Commission for review and uh, review it again at our next regular meeting. I'll, I'll treat that as a friendly amendment to be included in my motion. Okay. Is that okay with the second? It is. Okay. Okay, so we have three items that we are addressing on the consent agenda. Uh, please call the roll to uh, approve as amended. Thank you, and for clarification, item 25 will move to 13.1, and item 54 will move to 13.2, and the consent agenda is being approved as amended. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Thank you. Motion passes unanimously. Okay. We will now go to the regular agenda. Uh, item number seven, to consider plan for transition of indigent defense services to a county public defender's office by July 1st, 2022. 
approve addition of one full-time equivalent public defender to be funded in fiscal year 2021-22, direct the county administrative office to return no later than August 24th, 2021 with an update and take related actions as outlined in the memorandum of the county administrative officers officer. Uh, we have an executive uh, summary, attachment A and attachment B is a transition plan. Um, did you or uh, was um, Mr. Palacios, was it you or? Uh, yeah, Chair McPherson, I'm yeah. Nicole uh, Sober and Assistant Nicole, come, come over, sure. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, um, Chair and members of the board. So um, I am Nicole Cover, an Assistant CAO. I'm joined today by Principal Administrative Analyst Sven Stafford, who's been working with me on the Public tr Defender Transition Plan. Um, also with us is Ajita Patel, our Director of Personnel. We've been collaborating closely with the Personnel Department on the various uh, personnel aspects of the plan. So she's with us in case there are questions. So today we're going to give you an update on um, the Public Defender Transition Plan, and I will turn to the agenda. Sven, you might need to put it in uh, presenter mode. It's showing the... There you go. So um, this is our agenda for this morning's presentation. We're gonna revisit um, our efforts to engage our stakeholders and tell you more about what's taken place today. Um, then we're going to go into some detail on the public defender transition plan and what that contains. And we will also summarize our recommendations and next steps for you. So before we begin on the transition plan, I just want to briefly summarize um, actions that have been taken to date and some of the board direction we've received. Um, so last November, the board took the first step and adopted an ordinance creating in county code the public defender's office and the position of public defender. Um, that ordinance uh, subsequently took effect in December. And we worked closely with personnel to develop a classification for the public defender position itself. Um, this past February, the board adopted that classification and the salary range for the public defender position. Um, also on this morning's agenda was the classifications and salary ranges for the public defender attorneys one through four. Um, the board, as a part of the consent agenda, adopted those classifications and salaries. Um, when we were here last fall, we had um, some conversations with the board and presented various materials, and we received direction from the board to continue to meet with our local partners and to bring back a detailed transition plan. Um, we were also asked to establish a clear policy for retaining the staff at the main firm of Bigham, Christensen, and Minsloff. And we've made um, some great progress on all of these in all of these areas, and we'll be discussing um, where we're at with you. So in terms of stakeholder engagement, um, we've held many meetings with local partners. You can see um, the partners listed there. We we're holding uh, regular weekly meetings with many of these individuals. Um, to date, we've met at least 10 times with our local partners to get their feedback on our transition plan um, and to work through various elements of that. Um, I think all of our partners are ag agree that moving forward with the public model is in the best interest of our indigent clients and for the long-term health and sustainability of the indigent defense system. We've also um, had the opportunity to consult with various experts on our transition. Um, that includes uh, the state public defender, Mary McComb, Santa Clara County public defender, Molly O'Neill, um, Contra Costa County public defender, Robin Lip Lipitsky, uh, Marin County public defender, Jose Varela, and Nevada County public defender, Carrie Klein. Um, we've um, been able to have some fruitful discussions with them about our case management system and staffing transition and other aspects of our plan. Um, I think at this point, there's widespread support for the transition plan being considered today. And so we're pleased to present that to you. Um, we've had tw over 20 formal and many informal meetings 
um, with the individuals I just mentioned that have led to the creation of this plan. In this section, we're going to highlight for you the process for transitioning staff with the main firm to the county. Um, as well, we'll discuss the public defender recruitment and our plans for that. And we're going to also briefly touch on other areas of the plan. So with that, I'm going to pass it to Sven, who's going to go into some more detail. Thanks, Nicole. Uh, good morning, board. Um, and so we'll start with uh, staff retention. Um, the, the most important piece of the new public defender office is going to be uh, the staff that, that constitutes it. Uh, we've been working with the staff of the main law firm, uh, met with them three times already uh, to go over their the new process and how we're going to try to bring them on board. Uh, that includes that they'll have the right of first opportunity for positions within the new public defender's office. Uh, we expect to um, provide them with conditional job offers by September 1st of this year. Uh, that'll provide the certainty of employment for them and also provide uh, contract stability um, and stability of work for, for the main firm. Um, we anticipate of having a, those conditional offers having a start date of July 1st, 2022, uh, which leads into us having a, a more turnkey transition model. Um, the personnel department has, has been working on a simplified application process for staff that will ensure that staff who meet minimum qualifications are moved forward to a hiring list. Uh, they'll then move forward to interviews that'll be um, you know, based on years of experience and the desire of candidates for specific positions within the public defender's office. Um, and that'll be conducted by, um, with each attorney and staff member uh, on a panel that's assembled, um, you know, in coordination with the main law firm and other local stakeholders. Uh, the personnel is also working, as Nicole mentioned, on new classifications. The attorney classifications are on Today's agenda, we're also going to be bringing forward with personnel uh, investigator classifications and then other support staff from the firm, such as legal secretaries, paralegals, um, and other administrative positions uh, already exist within the county structure and personnel is making every effort to simplify that recruitment process while uh, maintaining compliance with civil service rules. Um, and then, we're continuing to do monthly outreach with, uh, with staff at the main firm. And then in terms of organizational structure and other management positions, those will largely be decided after a public defender is retained. And so in terms of recruiting the public defender, this obviously will be a new uh, partner within our criminal justice system. Um, Personnel will be coming to the board uh, and recommending that recruitment for this position begin next month in April 2021. And, um, and then in terms of the recruitment process, uh, personnel will be recommending screening tools, uh, mainly an advisory panel uh, to provide additional guidance on selection of the public defender. Um, the process and, and is, is particularly important because several counties that we've talked to have had to go out two or even three times um, because of, uh, you know, lack of good processes in, in their initial recruitments. Um, and so it's important to, <clears throat> that we select members for the advisory panel that lack any conflicts of interest and that they possess, you know, awareness of the knowledge, skills, and abilities needed for the public defender position. Um, in terms of uh, timeline, the, we believe that the public defender could reasonably be um, in position by the fall, so October or so of, of this year. Um, there is a risk of having to do multiple recruitments, which is why we're recommending to, to start the recruitment now um, and other county partners that we've talked to, um, as Nicole mentioned, in Santa Clara and Marin and, and other places have, have really reinforced the idea that um, it's important to give the public defender as much time as possible to uh, establish those relationships and, um, and, and be able to build the office. Um, 
And so we've created a, um, tried to create a clear sort of set of roles and responsibilities for the transition. Uh, we've worked on this with uh, our, our partners, both at the main law firm and the, and the superior court, um, that the main, the main law firm will continue to provide indigent defense services through June 30th of 2022, uh, that they'll continue to provide guidance to county staff. Uh, and so we, re we do really appreciate their partnership over the last four months and helping us work through, uh, work through this process. Um, they'll help us co-develop a case transition plan so that can happen as smoothly as possible and clients can uh, retain their continuity of representation. And then the contract, they'll maintain their existing requirements in the contract. Uh, the new county public defender uh, won't do any direct handling of cases prior to July 1, 2022. They'll uh, mainly focus on build, building and strengthening relationships within our uh, local criminal justice system. They'll also be working on the case transition plan. And then they'll, uh, they'll be developing the team and office. And, yeah, and while we're doing this, we're taking as many steps as, as we reasonably can uh, to take care of the items in terms of conflicts and administration that we need to, to enable a smooth transition. Um, so we're working currently with the conflicts firms to extend those contracts for uh, at least one year. Um, that'll give us an opportunity to smoothly transition the main public defense service, give the public defender uh, time to get acclimated, and then make a decision um, based on their you know, professional experience and, and local conditions on what the uh, best fit is for uh, conflict services moving forward. Um, in terms of the administration transition plan, uh, we're currently working on a case management system RFP, and that should be coming before your board in April. Uh, we're working and collaborating with the district attorney on that system. We've also been collaborating with uh, the Superior Court uh, probation, and we'll be reaching out to the sheriff as well to make sure that we have uh, as many integrations as we can for that, for that case management system. Uh, we've been working with um, with our real property uh, division on uh, identifying a space for the for the office, um, we've been working with our internal services departments, uh, obviously personnel, general services, and others to to make sure that all of the all of the things that we need to have in place are in place for the office to be successful. And then, um, because we will be operating. Uh, uh, a little bit of an office next year, along with um, along with paying for the contracts through June of next year, there will be a couple uh, one-time costs, and we'll be we'll be bringing that um, in a supplemental budget in June uh, for the board to consider. Um, that'll include uh, you know salary for the public defender and some additional costs for uh, for limited staffing as we start up the office. Um, and then, uh, and some other, uh, some other one-time costs in terms of equipment. Um, and we're really looking at, uh, um, rolling over costs from this year's, this year's budget and identifying other, uh, one-time sources of revenue to, uh, offset any general fund impact. So I'll pass it back to Nicole. So today we're asking the board to approve the plan to transition indigent defense services to a county public defender's office by July 1st of 2022, as well as to approve the addition of the public defender, um, which we plan to fund next fiscal year in 21-22. Um, if the transition plan is approved, the CAO in partnership with the personnel department We'll be bringing several items to the board over the course of the spring and the summer related to the transition plan. Um, the first, the, couple, the two of which Sven mentioned, the public defender recruitment and the case management um, RFP next month. Um, these also include classifications of other new positions for the public defender's office, as well as the supplemental budget for one-time startup costs. And we'll, of course, are going to continue to collaborate with the current firms 
the Superior Core and other partners as we implement the transition. Um, and lastly, we're asking that the board direct our office to return with an update no later than the end of August. Um, at that time, we believe we should know the status of the staff within the main firm and how that transition is looking over to our new public defender's office. So we would like to provide an update on that and any other elements of the transition um, that we might be able to provide some additional information on. And with that, we're happy to, happy to answer in, any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you for that presentation and for your moving forward. I, I want to thank the CAO team for leading this process, uh, really in collaboration with our current public defender firm, our court system, and other partners that you mentioned. Um, I think it's a process that's going to provide us with a smooth transition and our uh, uh, contracted uh, system into a public system. Um, I really do look forward to receiving more details about the transition of case management. Uh, and I realize that may not come until after our August update, uh, but I just wanted to highlight that as a critical component of the transition. I'm sure you know it and you've mentioned it, uh, but thank you for this process and for working with uh, the others uh, that are so uh, directly involved. It's been a great team effort to get us here and I look forward to the transition come next year. Uh, are there any other comments from the board? Yeah, if I may. Uh, I had, yeah, thank you, Chairman. Uh, I've been against the whole transition from the beginning, but at this point, that's a moot point. And uh, now we, uh, I want to make sure we have a transition that is uh, smooth and that does not uh, impact cases where someone really needs a public defender right now. We're in a time of great confusion uh, with the COVID-19 and court cases being delayed. So I, I think it's very important, especially for the people that are facing a trial coming up or uh, facing some kind of charges that are brought against them, that, uh, that we do not have people fall uh, between the cracks and uh, uh, so I'm, I'm for going forward. I think a lot is going to depend on uh, how we treat the Bingham uh, law firm uh, in this whole transition. And as far as timelines, uh, hopefully if uh, the COVID-19 uh, uh, is still going on, that we're able to extend the timelines. I'm just worried about if we have a timeline and we, uh, if we have to rush it, uh, in order to try to fit that. But uh, I think that's being considered and uh, hopefully we'll work this out and uh, make sure people are defended uh, according to the law. Thank you. Well, um, any other comments from board members? Uh, uh, super. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'll make some brief comments. I mean, first, I just wanted to thank Ms. Coburn and Mr. Stafford for uh, their work, as well as the, the board had very specific asks in conjunction with the Public Defender's Office and the community outreach from uh, some months back. Every single one of those issues were addressed, and, and I really do want to appreciate that when that comes back that way. Uh, to Supervisor Caput's uh, concerns. Um, I, I think that, that all that's actually been built into this timeline. This seems to have an exceptionally long runway and very long transition process, a very smooth transition timeline. So I, I don't, I, I would share those concerns if this timeline were expedited, but from the beginning of this process to where we are now to the continued timeline in through next year seems like a very reasonable transition time. The only um, potential hang up will be as Mr. Stafford had noted, whether we are successful at recruiting an adequate candidate uh, and how that will impact the timeline. But I think that the, that the goals that are set forth aren't actually even that aggressive. I think they're very realistic from a timeline perspective, and I'm very comfortable with that. I do look forward to hearing uh, some of the public comment on this, especially from uh, the current public defender, who I know has been actively involved in this process. But I do appreciate the work of county staff on incorporating the board's concerns. Thank you. Mr. Coonerty, you, uh, Supervisor Coonerty, you had a comment? Yeah, and I'll, I'm, I may wait to hear what the, uh, what the public comment is, but in general, I want to appreciate staff's efforts um, to work collaboratively and figure out a plan that works and most importantly works for the people who are uh, being represented by our public defender 
provides that continuity um, and and excellent service. Uh, I do think that um, bringing on a public defender uh, in advance will give us an opportunity um, to work on policy issues. I think um, you know this board is very interested in specifically uh, around pretrial, um, in speeding up uh, pretrial uh, holds, uh, or you know, to getting people through the adjudicated uh, quickly, as well as some specialty courts that have focused around the issues that we often see uh, play out in the community, and so. Um, making sure that we have a public defender who is committed to that kind of policy implementation as well as operations, uh, smooth operations, uh, and obviously zealous advocacy will be important going forward. Very well. Thank you. Um, any other comments from supervisors? Chair, sure, I just also wanted to echo the thanks expressed to Ms. Coburn and Mr. Ang for their great presentation and all the work that the CAO's office has done on this transition. Um, it's, it really is um, uh, heartening and to see such a comprehensive effort working with all the parties involved. And I also really appreciate that uh, an effort has been made to uh, discuss the plan with similar jurisdictions throughout California. Um, so I feel quite confident in the uh, proposal as it is today. Thank you. Okay, we've had comments from the board. Uh, the comments from the public. Thank you, caller 2915. Your microphone is unmuted. Good morning. This is Becky Steinbrunner. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Good morning. I'm, I'm very interested in this uh, new program. I would like to know where the uh, new public defender's office would physically be. Would that be within the 701 Ocean Building, or would uh, the county need to find another satellite office, um, possibly causing expense in rentals or leases or whatever? Um, I, I also am, am really amazed to see that it will fit within the, the public defender's office $13 million budget. A $13 million budget is, to me, staggering. But I'm very grateful that this service is available to those who need it. Um, I see that one full-time position and in the future other administrative positions will be added. I want to ensure that there will be no um, other costs that are going to be added on to the budget that is already um, in trouble, <laughs> as we know. Um, and to that end, I would also like to put in a plug that your board better fund the um, county law library, where people can go and research things and represent themselves. That's another option. And um, the hours have been severely limited to only three, uh, four hours a day in the morning. But that is a fantastic resource, and we need to fund it better. That concludes my comment. Thank you. Thank you. There's, there are no other speakers to this item. There are no other speakers? Oh, sorry, Jay Rorty and Bigham also raised their hands. Oh, excuse me. Go ahead. Sure. Jay Rorty, your microphone is unmuted. Am I unmuted? Yes. Thank you. Uh, I don't know if the board heard my earlier comments. No. Um, I am uh, here to speak in support of the transition plan presented to the board by the CEO. Uh, first, I believe the board and the county owe an enormous debt of gratitude to Bigham, Christensen, Minsloff, and the conflict firms for their service over the past 30 years. In addition, their gracious engagement with the transition process assists us all. Uh, particular thanks to Ms. Coburn and Ms. Stafford, and Mr. S Stafford for their efforts in putting together the transition plan. They've taken care to meet with stakeholders and address a number of concerns raised by the defense and other communities. I support the plan and my additional comments really look forward to the coming year and some issues that may come up over the course of the coming year. Uh, on page eight, the, the plan notes that there is an assumption that the $13 million uh, budget covering the contract uh, will translate to a county agency. I think that's going to require a, 
a close second look. The plan appropriately builds in time for the public defender to come on board and prepare a budget to present to the board in spring 2022, but the board should be aware that the scope of the budget may be a significant issue. I understand that the CAO has and will continue to explore funding from the state, grants, and other sources to supplement the budget from the general fund, and the public defender uh, will be a significant function of the public defender to seek supplemental funding outside the county to reduce the cost of the general fund. However, the key figure in any defender budget is the cost per case, the money actually spent on the clients. The greater the operating cost, the fewer funds available for case, uh, uh, per client. And in order to assure the highest quality of representation, as provided by the Bigham firm, be maintained, the operating costs of the office must be known and the total proposed budget evaluated to ensure that the office has the resources necessary to provide effective representation. At the moment, we are unsure of the true cost per case and variables such as the office space, benefit package, and conflict terms could affect this. Thank you. We, we heard your complete comments. Thank you. El Bigham, your microphone is unmuted. Chair, I'm unsure if the caller is intending to speak. They keep raising and lowering their hand. Um, Mr. Bigham, would you like to speak? Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, I, uh, I just wanted to thank Jay for the kind remarks about our office's performance over the past 45 years. Um, I, I, I wanna say that the communication between our office and the CAO's office has improved. We've met with them um, frequently and will continue to do so. I think we've done a good job keeping the lawyers down on the farm, so to speak, and continuing working on their cases through this transition. We need to focus now on the other people, the, the administrative staff and the investigative staff, because this transition has triggered some anxiety and job insecurity. Um, I've addressed this with Sven and Nicole, and we're going to work on that next. It, I can't lose people during this transition because it will be very difficult to backfill those positions uh, for obvious reasons. But we are communicating and we're trying to be as client centered as we can through the process. So I think all in all, at least as far as today is concerned, they've done a good job and we're working with them uh, in a collaborative manner. Thank you. Thank you. Mandy Tovar, your microphone is available. Good morning. Am I? Uh, we, we can hear you. Can hear you. Okay, great. Good morning. My name is Mandy Tovar, and I am an attorney at the Public Defender's Office. I've been at Bigham Christensen and Men's Law for 16 years, and I just wanted to encourage the board to uh, take a good look at our local uh, community of attorneys. Uh, of attorneys, we have a lot of uh, very talented, diverse uh, attorneys in our office who have worked all over the state. And we are very much interested um, as a group in having somebody who you know, knows our community, who knows our clients, who knows this county um, in a way that we do. We've all been very much um, dedicated to this work. And we are very much, uh, like Larry said, we're, we're a little nervous about the transition given uh, all the talk about possibly opening it up to uh, people outside of this community. So I just wanted to uh, say that on behalf of everyone um, on my office, while we understand there's going to be a wide range of applicants, uh, we feel like this community has a very diverse and very talented uh, pool to choose from. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. There are no other speakers. Okay. I just want to say that um, and emphasize, re-emphasize again, this is no uh, indication that we are unhappy with the offices of Bigham and Christensen, who have been uh, providing nothing short of outstanding service uh, as in their public uh, defender's office uh, for us. Uh, this is just a, a time for uh, the public defender's office to become uh, included in the county envelope. And so I just want to repeat, and I know every, every, every other board member wants to say too, that the Office of Bingham and Christensen uh, for the public defender services through the years has been 
nothing short of fantastic and uh, very much appreciated. And I do, I uh, really do appreciate the uh, cooperative effort and the open discussion that has taken place to date. Uh, with that, um, we do have um, some recommendations to approve. There were three, I believe. Uh, I would entertain a motion to approve the recommendations as presented. And Mr. Sure. Oh, please, Supervisor Koenig, please go ahead. I'll move the recommended actions. I'll second. Okay. No other comments from the board. Please call the roll. Thank you, Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Friend. Aye. Coonerty. Aye. Caput. Aye. McPherson. Aye. Thank you. Have the motion passes unanimously. Thank you. We'll move to item number eight to consider report and presentation on the pretrial program and number of people held in jail pretrial as outlined in the memorandum of the chief probation officer. Mr. Hurrell. Is Fernando Hurrell going to be, Geraldo going to be presenting? Yes, they should be rejoining now as panelists. Okay, thank you. Good morning, Chair McPherson and Board of Supervisors. Fernando oh. Geraldo. Chief of Probation here, and uh, with me also is Sarah Fletcher, who is our Adult Services Director, who should be, um, I hope, in just a moment, uh, showing our presentation that we have for you. Um, so I'll wait for you to do that. Um, this morning, um, we'll provide you with an update on our important uh, pretrial services program. Uh, and I also believe that our Sheriff Hart um, and Alex Calvo are also here in case there are questions. Um, related to their roles in pretrial services. So thank you, Sarah. On August 22nd, 2017, the board directed the probation department to convene a meeting between the sheriffs, probation and the courts to develop recommendations for reducing the number of people held in jail before trial. Uh, this has been an ongoing issue, uh, not just in Santa Cruz, but throughout California and throughout the country. And we've been making um, uh, many efforts since uh, I've been here uh, and throughout the 2000s to address jail overcrowding. And of course, it became ever more important during this pandemic as we wanted to create uh, the opportunity uh, for space uh, and quarantining units in the jail. So uh, pretrial, uh, our unit became probably our most important unit at the start of the pandemic and continues to be very busy in that time. Now, in recent years, nearly two-thirds statewide of uh, county jail inmates have been pretrial pre detainees, in large part due to their inability to post cash bail. Individuals of communities of color are, are usually the populations that are most negatively impacted by cash money bail. Um, there is also renewed effort in 2019. Uh, the sheriff convened a jail overcrowding task force of which probation was part of, and we provide our partners with information and education uh, about our role in the uh, system with pretrial services, which will go into greater detail. So next slide, please, Sarah. Thank you. Statutory authority for pretrial services program can be found in California Penal Code Section 1318. While the main purpose, purpose of pretrial programs is to assure due process as, as outlined in the 14th Amendment, a robust pretrial program can have the added benefit of, of assisting in jail overcrowding. Again, so very important. Throughout the state, pretrial programs are run by a number of different agencies, including the probation departments, public defender's office, sheriffs, and nonprofits, or standalones uh, and vary in their targeted population. Uh, in recent years, with a focus on cash bail, uh, there have been a number of other probation departments that have come online and created pretrial services programs. Um, and in fact, we've hosted many of them uh, throughout the last decade who've come to learn and observe uh, the work that we do. Here's the mission. Uh, I won't read that, but I'll, I'll talk about what the goal of pretrial is. It's to assess all individuals that are booked into the county jail utilizing a validated risk assessment. Uh, should they not be eligible for other release opportunities such as, such as site and release upon uh, when they're arrested or uh, a release from jail? Mm -hmm. The results from the risk assessments in conjunction with a decision-making decision framework are utilized to inform release recommendations to the court. When possible, recommendations are also made for the court for pre-arraignment releases. Why does it matter? 
why should we have a pretrial program? Well, there is a lot of data that shows that pretrial decisions impact whether or not a defendant gets sentenced to jail or prison and for how long. So we know similarly situated individuals, one who remains incarcerated pretrial and one who might be released, the one who remains incarcerated is more likely to, to get sentenced to jail and go, and go to prison for longer periods of time. An increased length of pretrial detention for low and moderate risk defendants is associated with an in, increase in likelihood that they'll reoffend. So there's a there is evidence that they uh, more are more likely to recidivate. So that experience of incarceration, removal from the community, their supports, and so on. Um, pretrial supervision, and we have the evidence, and we'll show that in a second, um, may reduce failure to appear rates. And for done for one hundred or or more days, uh, new criminal activity. So um, we implemented or made renewed efforts. Um, actually, we've we've had pretrial services for some time, um, but back in I believe in two thousand three or two thousand four, in response to a grand jury report, we reconvened and, and made renewed efforts and um, put some resources into the pretrial program. So. Going back to 2006, uh, we once again renewed these efforts uh, and it was a response to jail overcrowding. How do we increase public safety? There's, there has been a historical commitment in this community to avoid unnecessary pretrial detention for juveniles and adults. Uh, and we know that many individuals in pretrial detention did not present a substantial public safety or flight risk. So uh, we wanted to know how can we better identify those individuals without compromising public safety? And lastly, we know building a new jail or jail beds are very, very costly. Next slide, please. Just a little bit on the historical perspective and some of the shifts we made in the instruments that we use, uh, the validated risk assessment instrument, as well as the increase in the number of individuals served on a daily basis in pretrial um, and the, the, the amount of work it uh, demands from our staff. So in 2006, we um, implemented the pretrial unit pro program, as I said earlier, and we were at first using the um, Virginia pretrial risk assessment instrument. In 13, um, we had consultants um, come and work with our department and also the courts as we really looked uh, at new ways and perhaps uh, a new tool that um, would allow us to increase, safely increase pretrial um, inmates held in pretrial um, th by using a different tool that required less of a, an interview type, um, but relied more on indicators, nine indicators that really were valid predictors of risk. So um, removing uh, uh, the, the, the lengthy time it took to interview clients really helped us increase assessments, as, as you see there, from 500 in 2006 to just uh, less than 10 years later, we were doing 2,000 risk assessments, increasing the population through the 40s and 60s and to where we are today, where in 2020, we did 1,500 assessments and have an average daily population of 176. Now, you'll see that the number of assessments um, decreased, and that has a lot to do with the zero bail uh, and other things that were put, in, put into place. So, the, you know, the system that we work in today and as a result of COVID looks a lot different than it has historically um, because of certain things that were put in place to keep uh, individuals safe, our staff safe in the jails, and of course, inmates safe. Uh, next next slide, please. Just wanna talk about our staffing levels. So in 2006, um, we had five probation officers and a unit supervisor and one support staff uh, in pretrial services. Uh, 2009, uh, during that uh, most recent economic crisis or preceding the current one, um, we lost a probation officer due to budget reductions. We were back before the board and, um, and we were approved two additional probation officer staff. But essentially, currently, we, we basically remain uh, the same. Uh, we have the same number of staff as we did in 2006 when we had a day, daily population of 40 individuals, where today in pretrial, we have about 180 individuals. So currently, we have five deputy probation officers two probation aides and one support staff that are operating a seven day a week uh, operation. Um, and of course, um, really to, we, we believe that we could probably re release, safely release more people if we actually had uh, better coverage and actually longer shifts um, that we could, you know, do uh, work at different hours to provide quicker releases. 
Next slide, please. So um, Sarah Fletcher will now um, go into a little bit more detail about how pretrial program works and release types. Take it away, Sarah. Good morning. I apologize in advance for how I sound. <laughs> I've been a bit under the weather, so I will do my best to get through this. Um, <clears throat> Uh, when we are uh, when we talk about looking at uh, pretrial release, um, we're really looking at um, about four different release types. In addition to, of course, um, cash money bail, um, there are a couple of release types that um, our pretrial program through probation is not involved with, and that is uh, an individual's promise to appear on their own recognizance or uh, a conditions uh, release with conditions. And then the those are for the lowest level uh, individuals. And then we have two levels of uh, monitoring supervised OR and intensive supervised OR that our department is involved with. And this can include um, use of different electronic devices as well, such as alcohol det detection devices and uh, GPS. The main difference between our supervised release and our intensive supervised release is that the intensive supervised release includes a type of home confinement. Some may refer to it as a house arrest where um, individuals' um, schedules and restrictions are, uh, uh, schedules and movements are more restricted. And uh, when we look at pretrial monitoring, it is different than probation supervision in that uh, our goal uh, with pretrial is to best support appearance in court and to remain crime-free until a case resolution versus our post-conviction supervision case management, which um, is focusing on longer-term uh, behavior change. Um, now, with both, of course, we want to uh, really uh, stay away, away from uh, blanket conditions across all individuals. We want to look for um, uh, court reminders. Um, excuse me. <clears throat> We want to um, look for ways to support appearance and um, remaining crime free, which include court reminders. Uh, and we track the data for um, cases that we override for um, release or detention recommendations. I'm, I don't want to go too far into the weeds here, but I wanted to provide a visual um, of here, it's a very basic visual of our system to really understand the layers of complexity and the importance of collaboration uh, and the many opportunities for reviewing cases at the pretrial stage. Uh, at the top left, you'll see um, the box outlined in blue is really the, the beginning, the arrest or citation stage. And uh, for individuals who um, may be cited and released eventually will appear in court, but for individuals that um, go downward and get booked in jail, um, they have the opportunity to post cash bail, or they may have the opportunity to be screened by um, the sheriff's correction staff and released with a promise to appear uh, for those um, offenses that are uh, appropriate based on statute. And for those cases that are not um, provided an opportunity to release at that point, they will be screened by pretrial staff. And uh, during that process, our staff reviews um, an individual's criminal history, as well as um, a variety of other systems, such as um, the court system, our probation case management system, and the jail system to look at the full picture of the individual. And we provide a report to the court, either at arraignment for a release decision, or when possible, at the pre-arraignment stage. For many years, our justice system partners have been working together <clears throat> to adjust trail overcrowding and pretrial detention. Um, probation has worked with the sheriff's corrections and the courts closely. And initially, our um, focus was on the um, looking for, um, excuse me, I'm just going, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to mute for just a moment.
I apologize. I'm trying not to cough in everyone's ear. So, um, uh, during our collaboration, initially our focus was on the misdemeanor population who often score higher on their risk to reoffend or fail to appear. However, it's um, often largely due to their substance use disorder, and, and there are often no recent crimes of violence. During the pretrial release, uh, we also um, try to engage um, individuals in voluntary services through the Probation Service Center when appropriate. During 2020, our collaborative efforts expanded to include creative solutions for those individuals pending lower level felony um, offenses, yet without immediate or significant public safety concerns. The image before you depicts a nearly 184% increase for the number of individuals monitored by the pretrial unit during the last four years alone. In January of um, 2019, the pretrial unit implemented a new case management module as new technology not only provided a direct link to our supervision case management system, but it afforded an opportunity to share information with our law enforcement partners and dispatch services in ways that we had not been able to do before. Added benefits included the addition of an automated phone reporting option to enhance direct staff communication, as well as automated reminders for court and other activities. For the health and safety of individuals incarcerated, as well as county staff, and the jail capacity was significantly reduced during the pandemic to allow for quarantine and containment units, creating spaces for various screenings and telehealth appointments and virtual attorney visits. The court process was significantly impacted as well, such as staggered or reduced calendars and limited physical appearances and transports. In March 2020, the court went live with their new text reminder system to assist in notifications as we all navigated the ongoing changes. The Judicial Council of California took steps in early 2020 to implement an emergency bail schedule, which significantly reduced the number of individuals requiring cash bail to secure their release. Even after the statewide order was recalled, many jurisdictions, including Santa Cruz County, continued to function under similar orders. New opportunities and considerations in light of public health guidelines led to unprecedented efforts to mitigate risk upon release rather than utilizing detention, saving vital jail bed space for the most serious and violent crimes. Emergency housing and hotel voucher programs through the county utilizing CARES Act funding and through the probation department have also been utilized to reduce the jail census, providing short-term stability to support court appearance and service engagement. Leveraging technology and creative solutions has been key for all partners, though implementation of virtual solutions did take some time and aging facilities has presented some logistical challenges. We look forward to exploring whether the, by leveraging new technologies, we continue to see sustained improvements as we have observed the overall decision to expand release opportunities has not resulted in a significant risk to public safety. And Sarah, I, I can take on the, the next few slides to give you a little bit of a break here. Okay, I apologize. Uh, I, tried, I tried to before and I was muted. So um, okay. do the next slide, go ahead. Um, I wanna talk about pre-trial outcomes, data and outcomes, which is key to this program to um, and important to the community as well as our individuals are released who may have been in, incarcerated in the past, but it's it's key to know that very few of the individuals that are in pretrial supervision, even as, even as our numbers have increased, reoffend that it's commit new offenses, um, and the majority of them do make it to their court appearance. That's those are the two public safety measures of pretrial reoffending um, while they are on pretrial ser services and making it to court. In 2020, our staff completed 1,550 public safety assessments. That's the tool that we use locally known as the PSA. Um, and again, it was down considerably from previous years, but that has a lot to do with the emergency zero bail. A lot of people weren't even brought to the jail, um, weren't booked into the jail. So there were fewer, fewer cases and many, many were eligible um, just to be released because there was no bail associated with their charges. Of the nearly 500 individuals whose pretrial case was closed in 2020, approximately half completed all requirements successfully. Uh, one quarter were closed to technical violations. That's, that's not new offenses, but that's failure to appear, 
failure to report as directed or failure to comply with electronic monitoring. Um, um, the failures to appear accounted for 15% of the closures. Um, so that's, uh, or 76 individuals. We had, and uh, 55 or 10 to 11% of the individuals, their case was closed due to new criminal activity. So 10% of the individuals uh, uh, committed a new criminal activity. Um, we've done deeper dives into analyzing that. Um, and those are crimes generally are, are misdemeanor crimes. Uh, a crime is a crime, and of course, uh, um, but they are tend to be misdemeanor substance use disorder type relate, related uh, activities. Those are the, usually what folks we offend for. I'll show you the next, uh, some of the trends that we see in data. These are seven, seven year trends. And really we haven't seen any uh, spikes uh, as we've expanded release opportunities. So we have, we establish a goal uh, in the industry, pre-trial industry, uh, for instance, safety rate, which is the rate at which individuals reoffend. Uh, Obviously, the gold standard would be no one reoffends, but our goal has been a 95% safety rate. Um, um, we've gotten close in 2020; we were 90% uh, close. So that's you know 10% in the individuals had new uh, criminal activity. But consistently, the the numbers have been high, and we'll, we will continue to work towards that 95% or better goal. Next slide, please, Sarah. Appearance rate, that's very, very critical. That means that defendants do make their court appearances when they are released on pretrial supervision. Um, our goal is 85% appearance rate. And uh, in 2020, as you can see, we met that goal. Uh, even as numbers increased, uh, even with the same number of, uh, of staff without increasing our staff. Um, so again, I, I want to give a, a big shout out to the staff in the pretrial unit who are they're, they actually have an office next to mine, and um, they're been the busiest unit uh, since um, COVID started with individuals coming here to get help, assistance, putting on their electronic monitoring equipment, recharging their batteries, taking phone phone calls, uh, and, and getting in and out of the jail to expedite uh, those releases. So um, I just want, want to thank my pretrial unit. Next slide, please. So there's some new opportunities uh, we've seen uh, in the last couple of years. One of the biggest has been um, our uh, probation service center, uh, which is here at 303 Water Street, uh, being able to use that for individuals um, who are amenable to maybe enhanced services or assistance during that pretrial period, which is monitoring, not supervision, but offering them some opportunities to um, start engaging in substance use disorder programs, uh, different classes such as anger management, employment programs, and so on. Um, our Prop 47 grant, the CAFES program, which is a coordinated access for effective treatment program, um, has allowed for some expanded services. Um, and we could not, um, we would not be true to the commitment here at probation um, of continuous quality improvement uh, if we didn't evaluate our work. And we are actually um, doing a couple studies. Um, one, we are about to begin as a pretrial study to determine how our pretrial programming um, um, works, um, how our supervision actually is impactful. Uh, and ultimately, we're also looking for ways, could we in fact safely release more individuals? Um, and, and presently, we are also doing a probation revocation challenge that's funded by the Arnold Ventures. And we're looking at the, um, the rate at which individuals on probation um, are uh, reincarcerated for technical violations or may in fact be sent to prison and looking for ways to, to improve in that area. That's a, uh, an area of concern uh, across California and across the country and a lot of individuals are, are we know probation is supposed to be an, uh, an, uh, an opportunity to avoid um, going to prison and, and it shouldn't be a, a net widener. So we're making serious efforts to, to look at that data and see what we're doing. Next slide, please. So if you remember bail reform um, in Senate Bill 10, which was bail reform was son, signed by Governor Brown in 2018, and that would have eliminated cash bail, which some states have in fact done, some jurisdictions have done, and that's largely related to the to, to really um, individuals actually only sitting in custody because they can't afford to post bail. And this could be for low level offenses and um, very, very costly. And of course, uh, sitting in custody, 
we there's many stories of people who have lost their employment, lost housing, uh, lost custody of their children, and so on. So, cash bail has ha has had harmful impacts. Um, Proposition 25, uh, the bail industry um, um, actually probably uh, I think it has access to billions of dollars. They were able able to get enough signatures to put um, Proposition 25 on the ballot in last November, which um, which the voters actually ultimately did not approve SB 10 implementation. So um, cash bail still remains as a result of, of Proposition 25. Since then, though, um, new bills have been introduced. And an example here is SB Senate Bill 262, which was just introduced uh, in January. Um, it would maintain a statewide zero bail schedule for many lower level offenses. And there's always exceptions to those violent felonies, domestic violence, sex offenders, uh, and, uh, and DUIs as well. So there, there is, uh, and I've been uh, in conversation um, with some of the individuals, Senator Hertzberger, that put together the original SB 10 implementation bills. And, uh, and there's a lot of talk at the state level to see what other things legislatively could be done to, to really um, make this more uh, an inequitable uh, and just system for individuals who, who are arrested and in pretrial detention. Next slide, Sarah. That may be it. So that uh, concludes our presentation. And so now I have uh, time for questions. Thank you. Thank you for this effort. Um, it's really helpful to understand in greater detail how the program works and how success is measured. Uh, and as we work through the, say, the stages of the pandemic, I'd like to ask a couple questions uh, about how we define success. Um, I know we've had some you know, uh, bail on again, off again an issue, uh, but I'm interested in knowing if we anticipate our pretrial caseload staying as high as it has as we hopefully exit the worst of COVID. Um, and then uh, go ahead. Sure, we, we've, um, it's remained relatively stable at around 180. There's been occasions where we've seen an excess of 200, but um, I believe that the numbers will stay the same. We saw an increase as, as the state uh, began exploring uh, SB 10 and there was talk about elimination of cash bail. It seems like the, the, you shine a light on, on an issue, people paid attention and we suddenly saw a spike in increases in our pretrial releases actually even more so than before. But recently we've, we've seen the average be around 170 to 180 individuals uh, on, on that. So. Um, um, Sarah, unless you have uh, any other uh, ideas about what that may look like or projections. Well, I, I would anticipate that, that we would likely not see our numbers go down anytime soon, given the delays in the court processing. Um, hopefully, as we move out of our pandemic times and, and more cases can be processed through the court and calendars um, are run more efficiently. Uh, I know they, they've been the court has been working um, very very hard to to be as efficient as possible to resolve cases and move things forward. But it, it is difficult when we're limited by capacity, um, and so I would anticipate that we could see a reduction over time as those cases get resolved. But um, we haven't we haven't seen any indicators yet that the numbers are going down. Thank you. Any other que questions from the board? Chair? Yes, Mr. Uh, Supervisor Koenig. Thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you, Officer Geraldo and uh, Ms. Fletcher for the enlightening report. I mean, it's pretty shocking that uh, nearly two thirds or, or at times more of our jail population are, are pre-trial. And uh, the report really highlights um, some of the great work that you're doing. Um, just one question, which is in two th uh, in the, on the appearance rate, um, and I saw that in 2016 to 2017, it dropped from 88.2% to 79%. It's pretty significant, nearly 10 points there. Uh, we've recovered a little bit up to 85%, which I, I know is the goal in 2020. Uh, I'm just wondering, first of all, what accounted for that drop back uh, between 2016, uh, 17, um, and whether 2020 is an anomaly or we've actually taken some action to uh, improve that. Well, I, when we first um, implemented the uh, the PSA court assessment, 
Um, we mentioned that there's a decision making framework that goes along with that. We have an assessment tool that gives us a score, and then we have a decision making framework that helps us balance that risk management. And when we first implemented um, the process, we had a more conservative decision making framework, which was in line with uh, other areas across the country. Uh, we were we were more in the middle, but we weren't the most conservative. We weren't the most um, liberal uh, decision-making framework. But over time, when we saw such high success rates and such low reoffense rates, and particularly low reoffense rates with um, violence, that indicated to us that we could release more people. We really don't need to hold people in custody um, if there's such a small population um, that uh, is creating a public safety concern. And so we looked for ways to open that up uh, more. And that's what we've done working with the courts and our partners is um, getting that um, confidence in the pretrial monitoring so that we could open up the opportunity for pretrial release to more individuals. And so we, we did anticipate that we would see um, a, a decline in appearance, particularly with our populations who um, I think I mentioned earlier, they may risk high as far as risk to reoffend and and fail to appear, but a lot of it is due to their substance use disorder and uh, homelessness is a big challenge as well. Um, but we have implemented uh, some additional measures such as we've tried to shorten the duration between their release and court appearance, um, implementing the court and text reminders both in our system and the court implemented their own text reminder system. So we're looking for creative solutions for individuals to get those um, dental nudges to appear, just like we all, um, I think, appear at our dentist appointments uh, because we get those text reminders and our doctor's appointments, we get those reminders. And so uh, we wanted to take that success from other um, avenues and, and look to um, uh, improve this, uh, the criminal justice system outcomes. And, and and quite frankly, given the just the the increase in our caseload sizes, we we are impressed with the success because as those numbers continue to climb, we we kept looking at our FTA and new criminal activity, and we're a bit concerned. But um, um, however, I sh we shouldn't be surprised that given the level of monitoring that our staff can provide to that, so um, they 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 maintain well, and and we'll consistently work to maintain that uh, at or above our our goal. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Yeah, that's really great to hear that uh, those those results are from a process of continuous improvement. So thank you. Mr. Chair, you're on mute. Thank you. Our, uh, we have a scheduled item for 1045, but we're going to complete discussion on this and then go uh, immediately to that scheduled item on the zone board. Uh, uh, zone five board of directors meeting. Uh, Mr. Friend, do you have a comment? Yeah, I have, I have a couple brief questions. Thank you, Chief and Ms. Fletcher. I, I apologize, Ms. Fletcher, you're not feeling well, but thank you for your dedication to make the presentation. Um, this, I didn't see this information in either the visual report or the agenda report, but please forgive me if I was mistaken. You had mentioned, Chief, I think in the agenda report about the quarterly meetings with judiciary and concurrence. Is there is there a percentage of concurrence? Do we have a sense of of where the courts are in in regards to the percentage of of agreement they are with the pretrial decisions that are made? Yeah, uh, yes, uh, we have been tracking that. The 2020 was an anomaly, um, given that everything was turned upside down, and so it's uh, right now. Um, and I think Sarah has the has some of that information. I don't have it before me. What the concurrence rate? Our goal overall is has been 75 percent concurrence rate. Overall, um, and um, but uh, Sarah, could you uh, do you have that information? The the rates right there, what it, what it was. But again, yes. just to caution that twenty twenty is like comparing apples and oranges to to before because everything is just so different. Uh, yes, we do. Uh, we saw an overall concurrence rate of about sixty percent, uh, with concurrence with release recommendations at about forty eight percent, and uh, concurrence with detention recommendations at 75 percent okay that's for 2020 but so i mean do we have a sort of a rolling average over the last i assume you've been tracking it the same way you've been tracking the recidivism rates so is there you have a goal of 75 but are we meeting that or is it generally lower than that we, it's, it has generally been lower uh i think our our highest year might have been uh close to 70 percent but we have not um we've not hit 
the the, the goal of seventy five percent with concurrence. Okay, so and it, it, I mean, I mean, since you're having these quarterly meetings, are they providing feedback as to what the ra the general rationale is? Well, the, uh, 2020, um, we have not had significant uh, uh, meetings like the jail crowding task force really since since COVID. We had our um, the uh, the committee that was convened by our sheriff in 2019 um, sort of kind of um, I wouldn't say abruptly ended, but COVID came came right after that. And, and so we haven't had discussions other than how could we really just safely release as many people as we can and how do you know how do we bring in more troops into pretrial to expedite those releases and and uh um so that's sort of in the focus um really is is releasing as many more people and and a lot of those releases have been outside of the framework of the pretrial assessment tool so um um so again i, I think that's what i'm going back to the data for where we're for right now for 2021 is a, is a little uh, and 2020 is, is a little unique, but we'll keep tracking that and, and, and keep working. With our I, think it's, I think it's also important to consider that over time we have legislative changes and how those impact uh, the, uh, our processes and cases. And we also um, provide information at the earliest stage possible when someone comes into custody. And by the time someone appears in court, there's often additional information that is a consideration for release or detention, particularly where there may be um, person victims um, related to that particular offense. And so this, our release recommendation is made um, at the earliest stage. And we know that it's, not, it, it, it's very complex as far as new information coming in from the DA's office and the defense attorney by the time the individual gets to court. So there, because there are opportunities also, some of our pretrial population, they, even if they haven't been released at arraignment, uh, which is our goal, um, if it's safely possible, sometimes later on down the road during the adjudication process, um, if more information comes to light that we can mitigate the risk of release, then some individuals are released on pretrial monitoring during their period of um, the processing of the case, even if it didn't happen at arraignment. So, so it's very complex uh, situation that concurrence doesn't uh, really articulate all of those layers. Okay. No, I, I understand that complexity, but I mean, it also, I suppose that presents the risk of the early assessment tool in general. Um, so my final question, and again, if this was covered, I mean, uh, but I don't think it was, which is, do we have an actual number of those that are in pretrial detention and the aver average length of their in essence, stay before a case is adjudicated? We don't have that at the moment, that information, unless I'm incorrect, Sarah. I know we, we don't have that and um, have had a little ch some challenges accessing that information. Okay. I, I mean, I don't know. I, I obviously, we can't, I don't know that there's anything we can particularly do to help that along, but it, it would, I think it'd be useful information because we, I, I can see the number of assessments. I can see the, the amount of recidivism, but if I've got somebody sitting in there for three years or five years, um, I mean, that's also an issue, right, uh, on a pretrial detention scenario and, and uh, how many people they are, the sort of length of stay. I think these, those would be useful information. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Any other comments from the board? Yeah, just uh, very quickly. Uh, first, I want to say uh, I want to congratulate you on good work. We, we're obviously in a, we're in a changing environment pre-COVID uh, and then COVID accelerated uh, and threw into chaos many things. And I think uh, your team has responded very well um, and done their best to continue to hit the metrics. It's frustrating that the state, uh, through these some of these reforms, has moved increased your caseload significantly, but hasn't increased the resources um, to provide the kind of oversight that 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 I think the community would expect and that 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 you all need for success. And so. Um, it's a uh, it's a frustrating situation, but given given your limited resources, I think you've done a, a good job. A couple quick questions: um, When you say people uh, reoffend, and it's primarily drug related offenses, does that mean that they're reoffending um, by uh, by violating uh, maybe terms of probation on their drug? drug tests or does that mean that they're engaging in offenses that are normally correlated to uh to drug crime uh so the 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 technical violations would be considered um 
where we've we've found out that for for instance they're on an alcohol monitor or they they we do a UA test. That's the uh, technical violation side, which may not be uh, necessarily a new criminal charge. The the criminal activity that we're re reporting out is actually when they are uh, new criminal activity. So it's an arrest or a site uh, for for being under the influence or being in possession or or something like that. Something like that, but it's not like they were stealing bikes to to pay for uh, a drug habit. That you wouldn't consider that a drug related crime. Oh, we we also have um, we don't have it for today, but we can get. We do have uh, statistics, and I think we've shown it before for for what a breakdown of what that the that ten percent of what it was, and and it is a combination. We've seen uh, substance use disorder um, and property crimes. You know, misdemeanor property crimes, just as you say, someone doing break. You know, stealing a bike for to to to, to get their fix. Basically, it'd be great if you could just. Yeah, all over those when you get a chance. Thank you. Yeah, we 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 uh, it, it's uh, it's always a little bit labor intensive, but we do have that, and it's important for us to know, um, you know, what kind of crimes there are occurring. Okay. So we can get that. And two other questions. One is, as said, uh, of the nearly 500 individuals whose pretrial cases were closed in 2020, nearly half completed all the requirements successfully. Okay. And then it goes on to say 85% appeared for court and uh, on and on and on. Um, but in terms of like, so what's the half, the half that are not meeting the requirements, what are those requirements that they're not meeting? That's a great question. And I know that chart can be misleading because our two primary uh, public safety measures are, are reoffending new criminal activity, which is at 10%. And then the FTA rate, failure to appear rate, which is 15%. However, when we look at the whole they, uh, population, there are individuals who, who actually do not com successfully complete pretrial um, and may be remanded back into custody for, for technical violations. So it's not that they didn't make it to court, and it's not that they committed a new offense, but they, had, uh, they were out of range. Uh, they cut their monitor off, which which does happen on occasion. Um, they had a positive UA, so those are the those are technical violations. Which our response has to be a public safety response. Um, it's not that they're always on the first violation brought in, but um, but we do have cases where you know they have stay away from victims, and and we discover that you know they're in close proximity. Recalling those would be technical violations, and we would generally bring those individuals back into custody. So that that is that fifty percent uh, um, population. Sarah, I, did I explain that right? Yeah, we we're looking those those um, statistics are based on when the, when we've closed out cases. So during, over the course of the year, as a case is closed out, we look at it as successful or unsuccessful. And if it's unsuccessful, what are those types of uh, what's leading to the, to those challenges? And and that's where the unsuccessful clients. That's the breakdown of. Uh, we've seen improvements in, in our appearance rate, but um, we have seen some increase in technical violations, although, you know, we do work with uh, individuals on a case-by-case -case basis and we contact the judge and sometimes there's a technical violation and we continue to work with that individual. Uh, and other times, if, it, if there's a significant public safety risk, then that individual will be brought back into custody. And there are also times where someone may be brought back into custody and then if their case continues for a while, they may be released again at some point um, if they um, do not present a safety risk um, down the road. These are generally uh, not person-to-person -person type crimes where um, the, the, the individuals themselves are, are, are harming themselves when it's around mm -hmm. you know, drug use, those kind of things. But those, that 50% doesn't involve uh, you know, an assault or, or, or theft or those types of things necessarily. Uh, if we don't react or respond appropriately, it could, but, um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that's to, to me, if you, uh, I'm sort of, I'm much more open to that because maybe a, uh, a technical violation prevents, gets people back aligned with services or treatment or, or whatever. And then, uh, and then you, you avoid the, the, the broader, you know, a more impactful issue where it's hurting somebody else as well. Um, so, so I guess that that's good because it makes me less concerned. Finally, my last question was, it looked like we had a dip in 2019 
in both uh, the safety rate and the appearance rate. Um, and then, uh, and then I understand what you're saying about 2020 being apples and oranges. Uh, but I guess I'm wondering when we move back to normal, uh, is, uh, is that dip in 2019, um, you know, a result of understaffing and challenging, uh, a challenging, changing nature or is, or is that just an anomaly and we're going to bounce back to sort of the 2017, 2018 rates? Well, you know, we've had discussions around around that without going into a you know like really in depth research. Um, but sometimes we we also consider that the the individuals we've been a little more flexible, or loosen the parameters around who is released. As we said, if you have too much success in your instrument tool, then they would say, you know what, you're you these are all. There's always a risk involved in in in, in the criminal justice system. So I think part of that uh, might have been. Um, um, uh, loosening up our decision-making framework and releasing a few folks that uh, weren't in terms of public safety, like um, going to assault, harm somebody, but were those types, the, the chronic recidivists, the folks that are re coming in and out of our doors are the, you know, mental health, struggling with mental health and substance use disorder. And, and those are a lot of those folks that, that re-offended um, that we, you know, we released where in the past, perhaps they would have stayed in custody, but they, they were released and, and quickly reoffended. And Sarah, if you can confirm or 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 add to that, that'd be great. But I think looking forward, um, we've learned a lot. We we actually learn more from failure than success in a lot of ways. Um, when we have too much success, as you said, maybe we're likely holding too many people. And so, we, by looking at um, the the challenges for those that are not successful. Uh, we've been able to implement new technology. Uh, we've been able to, with the Prop 47 CAFES grant, we've been able to work with the district attorney's office and community partners to increase diversion opportunities and to enhance services across the community and training for our partners. And so I think when we look forward, we may not necessarily be able to uh, compare future years exactly to prior years because we're taking lessons from um, from the challenge areas and implementing new strategies. So hopefully those new strategies that we're implementing will actually see some greater success and outcomes for I, I think uh, something else that, that I forgot to add around the, the, these rates is that we are, as more and more people uh, with zero bail put in place, um, so lots of folks are that perhaps would have come to pretrial that were lower risk and maybe had higher success rates, they're not, we're not seeing that. We're seeing generally more and more individuals that are are you know have a higher risk to to reoffend because I guess skimmed off the top because of all the changes that are happening. We and folks aren't even being booked in in many cases for certain types of crimes. We are getting um, uh, more challenging cases. So that's kind of the the our our shop talk and trying to analyze is what's what led to that little decrease. And those those are the things we think are playing a role in that. Right. And I appreciate it. I think it's, you know, it's, it's good to experiment and it's good to learn and iterate and adjust. Um, you know, I think, I think we'd like to see the 95% uh, hit. And so it's a, it's a balancing act, I understand for you all. Uh, but I just, just was curious. Thank you all. Thank you. Uh, can't hear you, Bruce. Supervisor Kappa, do you have any comments? Thank you. You know, uh, uh, Fernando, you've, uh, you've answered all my questions uh, uh, with the other uh, board members. I just want to tell you that you're doing a great job. appreciate everything you're doing. I, I just want to make sure I tell you that. Thank you. Well, 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 thank you, and I will be sure to share that with my staff because they're the ones out there uh, every single day throughout COVID. We, we never close our doors and have been, have been very busy, so I appreciate the, the recognition and um, but that goes to to my staff. Thank you. I I, I agree with you. Uh, without a good staff, uh, we'd all look pretty poor. So you're you're right. Your staff makes you look real good. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, and I and you'd be commended at the efficiency too of the staff too, with what you still have and maintain, and uh, the increased workload and so forth, and. Uh, Getting uh, the implementing these new directions, uh, they're on again, off again. Some of them from the state, but uh, very well done. Uh, doing it quickly and trying to do it as understandably under the same context of the same criteria. 
So uh, thank you very much. Are there any questions from the public? I have no speakers from the okay. public for this item. Okay, very good. Um, let's see, we will consider the, um, I don't think we need a, um, any motion on this. We just we, uh, really appreciate the, uh, the report. And uh, now we will move on to- Supervisor McPherson, we do need a motion. For, for which aspect of that, just to accept the report? That's right, accept okay. and file the report. Okay. I'll move, I'll move the recommended okay. action. Uh, I'll have a motion to consider or accept the report. Okay. Um, please call the roll. All right. And who is the second? I'll second. Thank you. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Thank you. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. I'm going to rate passes unanimously. We will now go to the scheduled item at 1045, it's number 14 on our agenda, the Zone 5 Board of Directors regular meeting. Um, Supervisor Friend, would you, or who would be taking this? Uh, the board, we're gonna recess in order to permit the Board of Directors of the Santa Cruz County Flood Control and Water Conservation District, Zone 5, to convene and carry out regularly scheduled meeting. The Zone 5 agenda of March 23rd, 2021 is on the agenda. Yeah, uh, Chair McPherson, Zone 5 is actually uh, run by the chair of the Board of Supervisors. And since we haven't actually selected a new chair, technically that would mean that Supervisor Caput is still the chair of Zone 5 unless we move item 7 up to make a decision on the chairperson and vice chairperson as our first item of business. But uh, actually, Supervisor Caput is technically the chair of Zone 5. until. Thank you for that back. clarification. Sure. I was wondering, I thought, well, zone seven, zone five, whatever. Okay. Uh, Mr. Caput, do you have the agenda? No, I, uh, every, everything's fine. I, I don't believe I'm the, uh, well, the uh, zone five. Uh, technically, um, you're not, I guess. Uh, yeah. Maybe I should ask the council, should we elect a, a chair, which would be the existing chair of the Board of Supervisors, I presume? And I don't have the agenda in front of me as well. Yes, uh, Chairman McPherson, I believe you could take um, item seven first, which is the regular agenda. Uh, item seven is the board of directors to consider election of the chairperson and vice chairperson of the zone five board for 2021. Um, and it would recommend that the current chair of the board serve as the chair of zone five. So I believe you could do that. Um, so Mr. Mr. Chair, what I would recommend is that we just do a call to order and a roll call on this item. Once we complete the roll call, uh, I believe we can move on to moving item seven up as the first item of business, and then you'll become the official chair of the item. Okay. We will do so. Uh, we will call that um, to order. Now, item seven, when you refer to item seven. So the item uh, one on this agenda is a call to order and the roll call. So, um, well, we'll call the uh, the zone board of directors meeting of uh, March twenty third, two thousand twenty one, to order, um, and then uh, please call the roll. Thank you, Director Koenig. Here. Friend. Here. Coonerty. Here. Caput. Aye. McPherson. Here. Yeah. Chair, directors yeah. Jeff and Bertrand are not on the call. Okay. So now we will, uh, can we move to elect a chair? That would be needed at this point. So yes, Mr. Uh, well, Mr. Chair, the, the item seven, which I believe we will move up to the beginning of the agenda, just says the board of directors for zone five to consider the election of a chairperson and vice chairperson of the zone five board for 2021 as outlined in the memo of the district engineer. We've traditionally just had the chair of the board and vice chair of the board. Um, obviously we can move to public comment after this item, but um, I would then nominate uh, Chair McPherson to be the chair and vice chair Koenig to be the vice chairperson of the zone five board for 2021. Second. Okay, we've got a motion a second. Is there any public comment? There's no public comment for this item. Okay, then I will move um, 
Call for the, uh, or call the roll, please. Thank you. Director Koenig? Aye. Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Thank you. Motion passes unanimously. Okay. And Chair McPherson, are you still uh, without the agenda? Yes, I am. I'm okay, sorry. that's okay. I, I think, um, Madam Clerk, if that's okay, then I'll just um, read some of the items on behalf of the chair, and then uh, the chair can actually direct the motions as they see fit. Mm -hmm. um, the second item on the agenda is to consider any additions or deletions to the consent and regular agendas. Are there any items from staff on that? There are no items on this. Okay, so Mr. Chair, the next item is oral communications. If you wouldn't mind calling for oral communication. Sure. Are there any oral communications on uh, for our scheduled item of number 14 with the Zone 5 Board of Directors? Any, any public comment? There are no speakers to this item. Okay. All right, Mr. Chair, the, the following item is the approval of the minutes. Approve. Uh, uh, have a motion to approve the minutes. So moved, Coonerty. I'll second the minutes, assuming there's no public comment on the item. There's no public comment on this item either. Okay. Call the roll, please. Thank you. Director Koenig? Aye. Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Thank you. Motion passes. And the final item, since we took the regular agenda item as the first item of the agenda, is just simply item five, which is the action on the consent agenda. And there's one item on the consent agenda. Um, Mr. Chair, if you would uh, direct the consent agenda for comments and a motion. Okay. Are there any comments from the board? Zone 5 board, any comments from the public? There are no comments from the public. I'll move approval. Second. Moved and seconded. Please call the roll. Thank you. Director Koenig? Aye. Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Thank you. Motion passes with attendance. Okay. Motion passes unanimously. Um, then I will say that uh, there's no other items on the agenda. Uh, we'll adjourn the meeting of the Zone 5 Board of Directors. Uh, we will go back to item number nine on the uh, regular agenda of uh, the Board of Supervisors, a public hearing to consider the 2020 General Plan Annual Report, accept and file two related annual reports, and take related actions as outlined in the memorandum of the Planning Director. We have the General Plan the 2020 General Plan Annual Report and the 2021 Housing Successor Agency Annual Report. I, is um, our Planning Director, Ms. Malloy, is she going to be presenting? I have Natisha Williams and Suzanne Eyes on the line. Okay. Um, we're just waiting. Uh, Maybe they, they need to be uh, notified. They have been promoted. Let's see. This is uh, Suzanne Williams, right? And Natisha? Yes. Natisha Williams. Uh, good. good morning, board. I believe uh, Natisha is going to start our presentation. Uh, Natisha, are you there? Okay. Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. If you could please mute one of your devices. All right. Is there still an echo? Yes, we hear you now. Okay, and I believe I'm supposed to share my screen, but I don't actually know how to, oh, there we go, share screen. There we go. Okay, can you see the presentation? Yes, we see it. Great, okay. Good morning, supervisors. My name is Natisha Williams, and I'm here today to present the 2020 General Plan Annual Report. And I'm here with Suzanne Issey, who will be discussing the Housing Successor Agency Annual Report later in the presentation. 
So first, we're going to take a look at the general plan annual report. State law and county code require that each year we prepare a general plan and report and a housing element annual progress report, or APR, for public hearing and review by the Planning Commission and the Board of Supervisors. This report is submitted by April 1st of each year to the Governor's Office of Planning Research and the State Department of Housing and Community Development. The General Plan Annual Report summarizes the number and status of general plan amendments processed in 2020, the status of major programs in the general plan, such as commercial agricultural land classification reviews, park site acquisitions, and changes to the urban services line. And um, it also reviews potential future general plan amendments and updates. Uh, it also includes the housing element annual progress report, which presents data and information on the county's progress in meeting our regional, our share of regional housing needs, as well as housing element programs um, that are all use, um, presented using spreadsheets formed um, by the HCD. So let's go to the next slide. Okay. The board approved three general plan amendments in 2020 related to the second part of updates to safety and hazard protection policies, including updated air quality policies and addressing climate change hazards and environmental justice. Um, it also approved the permanent room housing combining district, including modifications proposed by the Coastal Commission, as well as the public facility school employee and farm worker housing amendments, facilitating a variety of workforce housing projects. General plan amendments that are currently in progress include the sustainability policy and regulatory update, which includes revisions to several elements of the general plan and code modernization that will incorporate sustainability principles articulated in the vision of the Sustainable Santa Cruz County Plan. Um, also in process is the medical office building proposed on SoCal Avenue in Live Oak, which requires a general plan amendment and a rezone to allow professional and administrative office uses. This project is currently in, whoop, this project is currently in environmental uh, review. Okay. The housing element progress report is included in the general plan annual report. This section summarizes applications and permits for net new housing units in 2020 and data tables provided by the state. In your packet, we've included, <laughs> sorry about that. In your packet, we've included table B, table D, and summary tables in the original forms provided by, by HCD. Overall progress in meeting our regional housing needs allocation, or RENA, is summarized in Table B. 142 housing units were issued building permits in 2020 and applied towards our RENA. Information on the status and progress of housing element programs and policy implementation intended to meet our housing goals is summarized in Table D. And the summer, summary tables provided include applications received during the calendar year 2020. The county received eight um, excuse me, the county received 84 housing applications, proposing a total of 106 units. Approximately 85% of the applications were still in process at the end of 2020 and are expected to be approved in 2021 or have already been, been approved in the first months of this year. Some of the state reporting forms are not included as attachments to this report, but will be submitted to HCD and OPR. This includes Table A, which includes the housing development applications submitted in 2020, and Table A2, which includes all housing permits approved in 2020. These tables are very detailed and very large, so they're difficult to reproduce as attachments to the report. Um, but some of the information is provided here in Table B, as well as the summary tables. So we're going to take a closer look at Table B. Table B places the 142 new housing units into affordability categories that demonstrate the county's progress in meeting the allocated share of regional housing need. Under California law, all local governments are required to adequately plan to meet the housing needs of everyone in the community. Our housing element must ensure that land is zoned and available to accommodate our share of the projected regional housing need. 
AMBAG develops the RENA for this area, and the current RENA plan for the Monterey Bay region was adopted in June of 2014. It allocates a goal of 1,314 new housing units to the unincorporated area of the county for the nine-year planning period started, starting in January 1st, 2014 and ending December 31st, 2023. These units are distributed between four income categories, very low, low, moderate, and above moderate income. Santa Cruz County completed its seventh year of the current RENA cycle in 2020. Within the first seven years of this nine-year planning period, the county has permitted a total of 645 housing units. These units were issued at the following affordability levels, 72 very low, 85 low, 250 moderate, and 238 above moderate income. A total of 679 units remain for this arena cycle. As shown in this table, the 142 new units that apply towards our arena cycle for the year 2020 were nearly double the number of units from the year before. 64 of these units, or just under half of all the units counted towards our arena this past year, were PRH units. So we're going to take a closer look at these PRH units. In 2020, the county approved the PRH combining district to recognize the conversion of obsolete visitor accommodations to housing units that are considered affordable by design, meaning that due to their small size, lower than average rents, um, they may generally be charged at a lower rate. Oh, sorry, lower than average rents may generally be charged. Usually jurisdictions count new issued building permits towards meeting the arena, but jurisdictions may also count adaptive reuse units towards the arena, which are units that are now considered housing units, but were not previously considered housing units when they were first constructed. PRH units are therefore recorded in the housing element APR as new adaptive re reuse housing units and apply towards arena progress um, towards our progress in meeting the regional housing needs allocation. The table shown details eight PRH progress, uh, projects approved in 2020. Of the 64 total units created, 61 are estimated to be affordable, ranging from very low to moderate income affordability levels. As you can see, the PRH units approved last year have made a substantial contribution towards the county's arena. And with that, I believe we're moving on to Suzanne's portion of the presentation. Thank you, Natisha. Uh, good morning, uh, Chair and Board. Uh, so some of you may be familiar with this report from prior years. This is um, the report on the housing assets that we have were originated when former redevelopment AD was in place. Um, as you may know, in uh, 2011, the state decided to dissolve redevelopment ACs and um, created a, a sort of new type of uh, entity called a housing successor. In most communities, the county government itself, or in the case of cities, the city government becomes the housing successor. So that's the general uh, rule. And that is, in fact, the case in this county. Um, and so as the county now manage the former housing assets of the redevelopment agency, um, the state also at the time, shortly after the dissolution laws were passed, um, passed some additional legislation to require um, these new housing successor entities to report on the uses of those housing assets. So that's what this report is about. Um, the state in that legislation also directed that these reports be submitted to the state housing community development department at the same time that the are the end progress report that you should just present when that is presented to the state departments every year by April 1st, we include this uh, housing successor entity at the same time. Uh, this, this report primarily focuses on fiscal matters, so uses of the funds. The bulk of the assets uh, uh, held by the housing successor are actually the, um, the fund balance that was left over with the redevelopment agency when it was dissolved in the what was called at the time the housing set aside fund now that housing fund is called the the low mod um housing successor agency fund which is kind of a large <laughs> but that's basically what this lmihi 
HAF means. Um, so basically, the, the state is tracking with this report, you know, are we using the funds for the purpose that is required in state law? The, the main reason this sort of updated state law is really focuses the use of these funds on development of new affordable rent housing that is affordable primarily to uh, very low and low income households. There's increased requirements for a certain percentage of the units that are assisted with these funds to be um, affordable to extremely low income households. Um, and uh, there's uh, no longer actually way to provide things like home buyer programs and assistance for moderate income as there was back in the prior to the solution of the redevelopment agency. So we are following all of those requirements for use of the funds. Um, and some of the um, sig significant commitments that have been made in the last several years um, that you may recall include the commitment of a $5 million loan to the uh, housing development that is uh, going to be um, starting short of the 17th and Capitola site, um, where we have the project approved with the two health clinics and the mid pen housing 57 units we have a five million dollar commitment to that project from this fund um, we will be close the escrow on that uh, disposition and close escrow on that loan next month um, that obviously is not going to be reflected in this fiscal year's report because this is reporting on fiscal year 1920. So although the funds have been committed in 920, the expenditure doesn't show up until we do the, do the report next year for the year that we're in. So we, we report on when the funds are actually expended from the fund, not just when committed. The other significant, or I should say commitment, was made uh, last year was the acquisition loan uh, to assist the purchase of a site in South County. Uh, we're currently calling that project the Pippin 2 project. Um, that loan was actually closed to enable that land purchase to occur last year. Um, so uh, the majority or the funds for that loan were on and are reflected in the expenditures in this report, but a portion of the funds are still yet to be dispersed. So there'll be a little bit more drawn on that loan um, in the next fiscal year. Um, so you will see in this current report, it does reflect we have an excess of 1.2 million. For those who may not understand some of this state jargon, um, what is an excess? An X surplus simply means it's a formula set in the state law that says if you have more uh, unencumbered fund balance on hand than the total of the revenues into the fund that you received in the last four years, then that amount is considered a surplus. Now, we do have an excess surplus by that definition of $1.2 million. But as soon as we close on that that loan uh, for the 18th and cap project next month, we'll essentially eliminate that excess surplus. So we will be back in its good graces uh, by <laughs> the time we submit this report next year. So uh, that concludes my presentation and happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Any comments from the board? Uh, Supervisor Koenig? Thank you, Chair, uh, and thank you, staff, for that great presentation. Uh, I did just have a couple comments and, and some questions. Um, uh, I also wanted to thank staff for providing Table A, which uh, was not included in our agenda packet, but did include a substantial amount of data that will ultimately be submitted with this report. Um, I just wanted to point out that the of the 2020 density bonus projects, all of them are in the first district. Um, and I will say uh, I, I find that exciting. Um, as we've seen with the uh, Sustainable Santa Cruz plan, we really need to focus on uh, creating walkable communities and infill projects. And so uh, I'm honestly quite excited that so many of these projects um, are in the first district today and welcome those. 
um, and also look forward to navigating uh, the construction of the medical office building, um, namely Kaiser. Uh, I just wanted to point out that uh, you know we've built just 23% of the very low income units that we're supposed to, uh, according to the RENA goals. So that's less than one quarter. Uh, if we adjust for the fact that there are three years remaining in this cycle, uh, we've still only built 33 or 34%, um, you know, according, according to the schedule. And um, I guess a question for staff would be if there's any suggestions on ways that we can accelerate that. Um, uh, yes, uh, Commissioner Koenig. So um, I will say that we will have some substantial improvements in those numbers once the building permits pull two projects I mentioned. Those include that 17th thing cap and also the, the project uh, Pippin 2. So both of those projects will be significant. They're not 100% very low income, but they will include significant numbers of very low income units. Um, additionally, we will. So the, the projects mentioned the density bonus projects, um, I believe to the three of very low income units. Now for the purpose of the RENA reports, those units are not actually counted until the applicant pulls the building permits those. So hopefully they will before the uh, RENA cycle is done. And when that occurs, those very low income units will also be added to the table. Um, right now they are listed in the overall package that we send to this as approved projects, so they get their entitlements, but the actual units don't go on that, that key table that sort of tracks our RENA performance and the applicant pulls a building permit. Um, and we do understand that, you know, the pandemic has made some of these projects a little harder to get off the ground. You know, the economy was a lot more certain, um, uh, particularly because they were mixed use projects. And so that commercial component, uh, to get a little harder against the projects. Uh, we are optimistic as we come out of the pandemic, hopefully those, those uh, applicants will be able to get those projects off the ground. That will help as well. In addition, to the extent that we other projects come through that density bonus. Generally, whenever somebody proposes a rental project with the density bonus, um, sort of the most strategic thing to do to include very low income in the proposal because you get most bonus per unit if you do that. That's how they set up the program specifically to incentivize very low unit production. And that seems to work. Uh, the developers accept that. So, um, you know, we do anticipate that we will probably have some other projects come through the pipeline before the end of this cycle that also uh, access that program. And so we are optimistic that we will get substantially up to the level of that requirement. That's very encouraging news. Thank you. Um, one other question. Uh, I noticed there's, there's a lot of programs that you guys are managing over there. and um, just. In general, how do you prioritize those programs that, that you're running in the planning department? That is a great question. <laughs> you know, we have to be very strategic, and our staff um, has been shrinking uh, you know, step by step as the read agency has been dissolved now for 10 years. Um, so they have a significantly larger and you know it is shrinking and you know now we're four <laughs> and you know it kind of reminds me of some of the Agatha Christie uh <laughs> well, then then none you know hopefully we won't get down that low um but it, it is a challenge time I'll be honest with you and with these two disasters that this year um you know we've had to triage and prioritize absolute must do uh, uh, priorities, um, much of which in the year have included disaster response. You know, there was housing is cyclical. So when there's a disaster, when there's an economic recession, you tend to get a response from the state federal level of a, a lot of sort of emergency funding uh, and other types of programs. And that all means that staff, housing staff at the local level have to administer those programs and figure out how to roll them out. So that is a lot of what we've been doing in the past year or so, both with the fire response and the, the pandemic response. 
Um, and, and so we have had as much time, a lot of the things we thought we had done this year in 2020, you know, if you had asked us last year what our priorities were, they were very different than the way the year actually rolled out. So we are trying to do the best we can, you know, we're public servants like everybody else and we're trying our head water and, uh, keep all of our ball in the air and, and keep the programs we have to do afloat. Um, the, the, the priority projects to be opportunistic sense of, you know, when we have capital projects that need to close, we need to get those off the ground. So major priorities right now are the 17th and cap um, project, getting that closed and off and running. And the Pippin 2 project, which will be coming to your board um, in the next several weeks for design review. And then that'll create a lot of back office work for us in the housing section uh, once that is um, on its way. Uh, as well as rolling out the, um, the uh, emergency rental program, COVID relief program, uh, which has taken up a lot of our bandwidth since January. So that's a long answer to your short question. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I, I know you're juggling a lot. Uh, and, you know, I just want to reiterate that uh, me and my office are, are happy to help however we can. I mean, you know, for example, I noticed with the ADU loan program of the 300K in initial budget that, um, is, as you stated, uh, or in, in response to some of my questions, I'd emailed 260K is still available. Um, so we're happy to help publicize that and uh, get greater participation in the program. That's all my questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Friend, questions? Right, no, thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't have any questions, but I appreciate this presentation. I appreciate the questions of my colleague. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Coonerty? I agree, Mr. Chair. Uh, I appreciate all the information. I appreciate the work being done at this critical time. Don't have any questions. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Caput? Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the report. It, I'm looking at uh, all the uh, proposals and uh, uh, what's happened in the last couple of years has been a, a balancing of uh, each district uh, contributing and trying to get uh, more uh, low income and moderate uh, income housing assets. Uh, the concern a few years back was uh, the amount uh, that has been uh, put on the uh, uh, South County and that, uh, that includes uh, District uh, 2, uh, the Aptos area and the Watsonville area. And uh, I'm looking uh, specifically at different projects that the city of Watsonville has approved also. And uh, uh, the Atkinson Lane, uh, which would be considered now Pippin number two, uh, where 174 possible units can be built. Um, uh, my only concern is that we, we balance this out, that all the districts uh, contribute. I know in, uh, the uh, Live Oak area, they've, uh, they've been building uh, uh, affordable housing for low income and also uh, senior income, uh, where a lot of seniors are on a fixed income, which is really important to uh, consider. But uh, I'd like to see more uh, in the other districts uh, also contributing to the uh, uh, low income and very low income, uh, you know, housing. So uh, if we can keep a balance, that'd be great. Uh, and also considering that when we're building more uh, housing, that we have to consider the, uh, the traffic problems that are gonna be uh, impacting that whole area. And that's the big concern I have for Atkinson Lane uh, right now, it says 174 possible units total. Uh, but, uh, uh, and also parks. Uh, we need more park space uh, for kids so they don't have to travel all the way across a, a city or whatever to get to a, the nearest park. So 
uh, considerations for possible schools and also uh, consideration for parks and traffic. I know the Atkinson Lane, part of it's in the county and part of it's going to be in the city. And uh, public safety would have to be the Watsonville uh, Police Department, of course, and also the Watsonville Fire Department would have to cover that area. It only makes sense. And the big concern is the uh, traffic that would be uh, totally impact uh, the Brewington Avenue access to Atkinson Lane. If uh, we need more pump, we have to have in person uh, later on when this uh, COVID uh, uh, eases up, uh, where people can voice their concerns on how uh, ac uh, access to Atkinson Lane will impact uh, Brewington and uh, that whole area, opening that up uh, to a lot of traffic. So uh, I just want more public input on uh, the areas in South County and uh, also consideration for parks and uh, uh, possibly uh, another elementary school if we have to have one in, in that area. Uh, you have any comments on that? I don't know if that's a direct question or how you might answer that. Well, basically, um, uh, the Atkinson Lane one is the, uh, I'm for it, but I want to make sure that we uh, uh, we have a pub more public input. We actually listen to people, that we don't have fixed numbers, and then we have public comment and people come and say, hey, I have a problem with this. And then we say, well, thank you for coming and thank you for commenting. But then we have a fixed number and we ignore uh, what the public has to say. Well, we, we just have to change that uh, that that yeah. process, I guess. Somehow, uh, uh, maybe some things can't be changed. I, I don't know how to answer. It. I'm not the one to answer it. But, uh, um, Supervisor Caput, this um, Carlos Palacios, County Administrative Officer. Um, I can assure you that we will have a very robust um, public process with regard to Pippin Number Two. Um, as it gets developed. So there, it's a very, it's still in the early stages and there will be a lot of public input and opportunities for the public to comment uh, on the proposal. Yeah, I, and I, I know that that's gonna happen. I guess the only concern I have is that when we go through that process, are these numbers uh, fixed in stone that even though people are gonna make comments, uh, we can actually uh, lessen or somehow work out all of the uh, uh, the numbers. Um, uh, are, we, are we approving the numbers right now? Should, should I respond? Go ahead. Yes, please, if you can. Uh, please. I don't think so. But so I, yeah. I just want to note that I, I want to be very general because the, the agenda item we're discussing currently is the annual report and not the uh, Pippin project specifically. Uh, but I will say that it will be coming before your board in several weeks. And so there'll be an opportunity for public comment at that time. Um, and I will just add by way of bound that the project at the site you're referring to was actually entitled the number of units and a planned development permit was up in 2009. So the only matter coming to the board, uh, as I mentioned in several weeks, is the design review of the proposal for the first 80 units in that project. There is, is no proposal at this time to build the full project was entitled, just the first 80 units. However, it, it has been entitled for years now. So um, I believe that's that's what Commissioner, I mean, uh, Supervisor Caput is referring to in terms of the numbers being fixed. That that entitlement has been a while. Right. I, and uh, the, the final comment, and it's not really a question, is uh, the city of Watsonville is, is looking at approving uh, 
about a hundred uh, units also off of Maloney Parkway, and that's a city one also. So when we when we have allocations uh, with the state of California, uh, if we build, let's say we build uh, two hundred units somewhere in one specific locale, that counts for uh, money from the state of California for the entire county, not just the uh, district where all the housing is going in. And uh, so I just want to make sure we balance this out. We don't have everything. Well, we're, we're, we're doing a lot better in the last few years. I have to say, uh, when you count Live Oak area and you count also Aptos, uh, we're balancing it out. So I just want to see more balance in the uh, other districts of the uh, county for our state allocation. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, I think, is that in your comments then, Mr. Uh, yeah, Kevin? No, that's fine. I, okay. I just want to make that clear. Yeah, I don't want to be confident, but there are some limitations. I know in my particular districts, uh, the, the sewage and water limitations, um, it's really difficult to keep up with uh, those communities. I understand what you're saying. We want to spread this out as much as we can throughout the county, uh, but there are limitations in some areas of the county. Uh, and my uh, San Lorenzo Valley is one of them uh, because of water and uh, sewage or septic uh, issues in particular. But uh, that's not be, to be confrontational, but uh, I think each district should play its part to the best of its ability in, in meeting this uh, housing need that we have. Um, I'd like to thank the uh, planning department and the housing division in particular for the report. I, there's a lot of good information here about our work in recent years and I, uh, that we've broadened our housing base and uh, we reduced some barriers too within our codes and our application uh, approval system. So I want to thank them uh, for their efforts, their ongoing efforts. Um, and as usual, the uh, regional housing needs allocation or arena numbers are difficult to meet in many circumstances. Uh, but in particular in Santa Cruz County historically, but uh, we're gaining on it. We're almost halfway there to what the state would like us to accomplish. And I'm hoping with the uh, sustainable county plan that we are continue, will continue to increase uh, our affordable housing through more dense and mixed use housing, wherever that is going to be located. Um, and it's going to retire. Um, it's going to be require a commitment by the entire community uh, throughout the county to, um, to really uh, address that. Um, and there's two additional processes that I think are going to be very important though. And, and that's as soon as possible, we need to create uh, what's been discussed for some time, a one-stop permitting center that we've been discussing for a couple of years. And uh, uh, we, I think we can learn from our fire, permitting, uh, reco fire recovery permitting center about how to uh, quickly evaluate applications uh, for building. And then secondly, identifying uh, our county-owned uh, land and using our land use authority to develop affordable housing. And I think we're going to be assisted in that very much by the, uh, the facilities plan that we were just uh, heard about more about uh, a month ago or so. So I think those are two issues that um, we need to address as uh, additional processes that we need to complete and get done so we can serve um, the public as best we can uh, to and help us meet our housing needs. Um, on um, yes, sorry, this is Ryan Coonerty, and I just uh, I mean I don't want to belabor the point, but it's important to make sure we're all on the same page. The city of Santa Cruz is approving far more housing projects than any other jurisdiction in the county, um, both in the city, and then you recently had the UCSE building three thousand more units up on campus. Um, so just it's, it is, I think, um, I understand the point and I also think, uh, everyone is, uh, is doing much more than they've ever done. And in fact, uh, the North end of the County is building far more housing right now than, than any other part of the County. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. I, I just wanted to, one more point, beginning on page 49 of the packet, there's a mention of land use and zoning corrections being undertaken by the planning department. Uh, do we anticipate any of these uh, 
going to be uh, going to result in a higher number of parcels eligible for residential development. I, in light of the facilities plan that we recently discussed that I mentioned, um, do we anticipate um, any of those will result in a higher number of parcels eligible for residential development? Right, so our staff has taken a look at a number of these um, inconsistencies. And like we stated in the report, we will be, where possible, incorporating them in our updates with the sustainability update project. Um, most of those are just, you know, reflecting what's currently on the property. So um, it's not necessarily anything that would create an opportunity for additional housing unless there were projects that would come into those specific sites for additional units. Really what it's doing is reflecting the current uses on those properties. Thank you, thank you. And on the sustainable Santa Cruz County plan, what parts of that update do we anticipate uh, will lead to more housing development, um, especially affordable housing? Is there a timeline for completion of that, the sustainable uh, Santa Cruz County plan? and what impact it would might have in housing development? Right, um, the sustainable Santa Cruz, um, so the sustainable. Man, you were locked up. The um, I, I can chime in if, if we're waiting for Natisha the Wi-Fi to cooperate. Um, <laughs> okay. I, I will just note that um, we, we have a number of different, and sometimes they have similar names, so I, I just want to make sure uh, I understand the question. Um, we did have a plan that was more of a conceptual plan and not a rezoning or any kind of formal general plan, and that was called the Sustainable Santa Cruz County Plan, I believe, um, that was approved by your board uh, some years ago, I think maybe five or six years ago, possibly. Um, however, the project that uh, staff is currently working on in our department is what we call the sustainability update, major update of the land use element of our general plan. Okay. Um, and uh, perhaps is that is that what uh, Joe yes. was referring to? Yes. Yes. Okay. So. So yes, that that plan. Um, I guess the the main answer to your question is yes and no. So the overall goal of the plan is yes that it will um, have the effect of increasing the um, the number of housing sites that we would have for our future housing element update, which will be coming through in. Um, you know, shortly in several years, um, but the actual rezoning is necessary to um, bring the zoning map into compliance with that updated uh, general plan will be a second step. So it will be sort of a two-step process. And, uh, Stephanie Hansen, who leads up our sustainability section, could talk to you in a lot more detail than I can about that effort because her section is leading that effort. I, I do collaborate with them on that, but I'm not fully up to speed on all the procedural details in, as far as their plan is it currently but but that is the overall goal and and just to elaborate on that a little bit um we anticipate receiving our new rena allocation for next housing element uh within the, the next i believe is within the next within the next year and and when we we will need to accommodate that that what we anticipate will be a significantly larger allocation than we got the, the current cycle and um, so it is likely that we will need to make some changes to our land use plan or our zoning um, map to accommodate that higher number of units. So we'll be coming back to the board um, over the next uh, year, two years, um, to recommend changes necessary to do this. Okay, thank you. Understood. Yeah, thank you. Are there any questions from the public? There are no public speakers to this item. Carrie, you muted. Yeah, so I, I, I'm going to return this to the board. Excuse if there's some, you hear some noise um, that we would uh, 
take the related actions to uh, report uh, to the governor's office of planning and research and housing and community development um, and accept and file this report. Chair. Uh, yes, for, Mr. Coney. Just want to point out one small thing to staff uh, on the report on packet page 55. Um, 17th and Capitola Road, it says units built, 57. I understand we're making great progress uh, on the housing, but I don't believe those units have actually been built yet. Um, so maybe just check that before submitting this report. And with that, I would be willing to move the recommended actions. Second. We have a motion to second uh, with that uh, correction uh, identified by uh, Mr. Koenig. Uh, please call the roll. Thank you. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Cabot? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Thank you. Motion passes unanimously. Okay. I would like to continue with uh, through our regular agenda of items 10. Uh, 11 has been deleted and 12 and 13. And then um, we'll go into closed session. Well, we'll try to get everything done before we go to closed session, uh, as well as the agenda, the uh, the uh, consent agenda items. Uh, so we'll go ahead with uh, item number 10 at this point. Public hearing to consider the proposed formation of six Rule 20A underground utility districts. Adopt resolution declaring the six Rule 20A project sites as separate utility districts and take related actions as outlined in the memorandum of the Deputy CAO Director of Public Works, that is Matt, Matt Machado. Uh, we have a resolution, Underground U Utility Districts 2025, Exhibit A, Proposed Underground Utility Districts, eight and a half by 11. Exhibit A, Proposed Underground Utility Districts, full size, online and on file. And a resolution number 280-2020, adopted in December 8th of 2020. I believe uh, Mr. Machado will be presenting this. We all know that under, undergrounding is a very excess, uh, expensive process. So is Mr. Machado going to present? I have Greg Jones on the line to present for this department. Yeah, good, good morning, almost afternoon, Chair and members of the board. My name is Greg Jones and I'm the Senior Civil Engineer overseeing the survey section in Public Works and I'm also your County Surveyor. We are here today to open a public hearing regarding the creation of six new undergrounding utility districts per the California Public Utilities Commission Rule 20A program. The Rule 20A program was established by the California Public Utility Commission to require utility companies throughout California to, pre to perform requested undergrounding projects by the cities and counties of our state. Rule 20A is specifically focused on the undergrounding of utilities in the areas directly affecting the general public. In Santa Cruz County, utility undergrounding districts have historically been formed in the town core areas for aesthetic purposes. However, due to disaster events like the recent CZU fire and the devastating storms in 2016 and 17, we see an increasing need to underground utilities for safety purposes along the county's major evacuation and commuter routes. Public Works proposed 14 different locations to the board in August, 2020. Public Works then returned to the board in December 8th, 2020 with a proposal for six of these locations to be formed in two utility undergrounding districts and a resolution for this public hearing. The six locations are chosen based on evacuation route planning and roads that have historical problems with downed power lines and utility lines interrupting both utility service and the road network. So the six proposed utility districts in order of priority are three locations on Soquel San Jose Road, the first Laurel Glen Road to Olive Springs Road, the second Olive Springs Road to Hoover Road, the third Hoover Road to Amaya Ridge Road, and then Bear Creek Road between Harmon Gulch Road and Star Creek Road, and then Empire Grade between Pine Flat Road and Alba Road, and last Trout Gulch and Valencia Road area between Quail Run Road and Martha's Way. 
Based on the information I presented to you, Public Work rec recommends that the port board take the following actions. Uh, conduct a public hearing on the creation of these six said underground utility districts pursuant to the county code. Adopt the attached resolution of intention to declare property of the proposed six project sites as being individual underground utility districts pursuant to the county code and to direct public works to work with the county clerk to notify all affected utility companies and property owners within the proposed undergrounding districts in adoption of the resolution within 10 days after the passage of the resolution in accordance with the county code. Uh, thank you very much and I'm here to answer any of your questions. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Supervisor Koenig, do you have any comments? Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for the presentation, Mr. Jones. Um, I'm just curious how the various segments or, or utility districts were determined on SoCal San Jose Road. On SoCal San Jose Road? Well, we, we worked with PG&E and asked them for a record of areas in which uh, multiple power lines had been damaged, pulls down, and they gave us a, uh, a PDF showing uh, the, the, the areas of most damage. So we looked at those swaths of the road and they were basically from, <clears throat> like I said, Laurel Glen and then up to, um, I think it was a Maya Ridge. That's where the line, the, the, the pg e line heads off onto private property. So that's how we de determine that. Got it. And is there any prioritization as far as um, you know, the, how those various sections? Those three sections? Were created with? Um, not, not really, but starting from Laurel Glen Road, where there's the most dense population, is, is probably the most ideal where we would start and then head up the hill from there. Because once you get to Amaya Ridge Road, uh, there's fewer, fewer parcels, bigger parcels of land up there. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so it sounds like it's not determined yet. Um, I've just had a number of constituents comment that you know they think it would make more sense to begin from the top and work down, and that's based on their impression of the risk level. Um, so maybe looking at at um, well, excuse me, sorry. <laughs> that's fine. Yeah, but go go maybe assessing which segment to start with based on risk, or as you said, I mean, it sounds like you've already done some of the analysis in terms of the number of uh, down utility lines in those different areas. So, um, yes, and also a lot of this is based on evacuation. So we want to make sure that we can get people off the mountain, uh, coming down into Santa Cruz and SoCal area, in a in a fast manner. So. So having those lines underground in the areas that PG&E has identified multiple times that uh, lines have come down, that's how we decided that. Mm -hmm. Right, that makes sense. So currently there would be no plan to underground the section north of Amaya Ridge Road up to Summit. Simply because well, according to these six sites, this is what we're proposing. There are other sites that we could propose in the, in the future. The only thing is the limited amount of funding, of course. Right. Okay, thank you. That's all my questions. Okay. Uh, Supervisor Friend? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Jones, for the presentation. I, I just want to make sure that I've got something clear because I, I didn't recollect in the original presentation in August, nor did I see it in this board memo, that there was prioritization within the districts, uh, meaning the, the undergrounding districts, not the supervisorial districts. And, and it, the way I just understood your presentation was that there was, is that correct? Um, the, the priority in the supervisorial districts? No, no, I didn't, I didn't mean that. What I meant was within the, uh, the utility districts, I'm sorry. So, so for you outlined as six or so utility districts based on the feedback we provided in August in conjunction with you and PG&E, they, they, they appeared to just be six that would get done, not six that would be done in a particular priority order. I, I interpreted your presentation now to just say something differently. I just wanna make sure I'm understanding correctly. Yeah, this priority that I have, we have written down starting with SoCal San Jose Road and then working down Bear Creek Empire Grade and Trout Gulch Valencia. That was the priority that 
we we worked out together in public works based on um, the history from pg e Okay, and, and perhaps I, I missed that during the presentation of six months ago, but I, I remember being presented uh, options and providing feedback on locations, but not that there would be a priority within that list. Also, I didn't say that within the agenda report today, and so just, I mean, from a matter of just uh, transparency, I think that that would be helpful. It's not, it's not a criticism, it's just that that surprised me, and, 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 and generally speaking, we don't... Um, Surprises aren't always a great thing in, in these kinds of environments. I, I, I do, I do definitely agree with the Trout Gulch Valencia location. I said the same thing in August. It's a very important thing. I just was surprised to hear that it's, uh, in essence, on the bottom of this list. Although arguably on the top of a list of many other roads that weren't selected during this time. So I appreciate that as well. So do we have a then a realistic time frame of when at least uh, that one would be addressed? Um, these projects take between five to 10 years to get through design through PG&E and to completion. And we'll be pushing PG&E as fast as we can. We don't want to be taking this up to 50 years, of course. So I, I suspect there'll be some overlap between projects as we have the design pretty much worked out for the first one. And uh, if I may go back to your first question, uh, the, the priority, we have a list of 19 different districts in the past and just kind of order of priority for everybody else's sake. Um, the last one we we worked on as for public works with pg e utility companies was um, Seacliff area. And the one before that was Davenport. And the one before that was Ben Lomond. So that kind of gives you a, a general idea of, of how these have rolled out in the past 20 years. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate the locations, and I, I didn't mean to imply that that, that that my actual supervisorial district wasn't taking precedent. I, I just, again, I, 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 I could be wrong. I didn't recommend in the, recollect in the August presentation, and I definitely didn't see it in today's agenda report that these had an order. So I just think that that would be useful going forward so that the community also knows. Uh, yes. I've learned that from your own presentation, but I, I do appreciate it, Mr. Jones. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, Supervisor Coonerty, any questions? No questions. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Supervisor Caput. I just want to say thanks, and uh, I have no questions, but uh, thank you for the report. Okay. This is a public hearing. Is there, are there any comments from the public? I do too, have two speakers this item. I also saw that the director, Matt Machado, had his hand raised. He's now a panelist. Okay, let's hear from Mr. Machado. He might have further explanation of something before we go to the two public comments. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Matt Machado here, Public Works Director. Uh, a little, I just want to chime in with Supervisor Friend's comments uh, and how we came up with the six priorities. Um, to Mr. Jones's point, we did get some great information from PG&E, uh, but we also tried to develop a list that we could afford and so in the board item, it talks about the fund balance that we carry with pg &E. And so the hope is that we can afford these six. These six are prioritized based upon pg &E, uh, needs in terms of damage. Uh, and th this list was actually shared on December 8th as part of a board item. Uh, and that's where we first started talking about the prioritization. And that was, uh, it was a bit based upon um, district boundary. <laughs> Uh, as Mr. Jones described, but I, I just want to point out that the six districts we're proposing today, we are optimistically thinking it fits within our fund balance that we carry with pg &E. And so even though they are in priority list, uh, our hope is that we can start design and implement all of them with, uh, with the funds available. So thank you for the opportunity to just, uh, share a little additional clarification. Very good. Okay, we go to the, uh, I think there's two public comments. Yes, I have two speakers. Speakers, you'll have two minutes once your microphone is unmuted, and you will be muted automatically at the end of your time. Caller user four, your microphone is unmuted. Hi, this is Marilyn Garrett, and I have several questions as I'm listening. One is, uh, why doesn't PG&E fix their lines? I understand there's a device 
that can be put on the lines when they fall down so that it interrupts the surge of electricity, thereby the brush doesn't catch on fire. Um, and, our, you know, it's like it seems like we're paying over and over again for what is PG&E's uh, responsibility and causal problem. That's one question. And another is, I recall in Santa Cruz near the university, Noble Street area up there by High Street, it was underground lines, but and there were some light standards to provide street lights, and Verizon came along and has put antennas that they got approved, like they get re approved routinely, on these light standards. So my question is, uh, is that type of uh, proposal in this scenario? And the last question is, I understand, well, I, I think that, and who's paying for this? See, I hear you say a list we hope we can afford. Why is the county paying at all what seems to me PHE's responsibility? And I'll listen for your responses. Thank you. Caller 1999, your microphone is unmuted. You know, maybe we'll have, uh, I don't know if Mr. Jones or Mr. Machado might want to answer a couple of those questions directly. Um, yeah, uh, I'll go back to the how much can we afford part first. Uh, currently, the county, um, we received a letter from PG&E in uh, 2020 stating that we had $17 million, a little more than that credit, which is dollars basically. Um, and that's what we can work with. And also we can borrow up to five years um, from PG e on, on this type this type of a loan. We we uh, we we do about five hundred thousand dollars a year. Uh, PG e collects through tariffs. That's how this Rule Twenty A program was set up to collect tariffs through everybody who pays PG e in their bills, and that money goes to the undergrounding throughout the state and each city and county has their credit and ours right now is about 18 million dollars altogether to date um, as far as the verizon lines with the, uh, the 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 utility poles up on with the with antennas on poles i i can't speak to verizon on that i i really don't know a cell tower um design and then also with PG&E, um, when a pole comes down, the most important thing is to shut that thing down as quickly as possible. And everybody needs to stand back and let PG&E do their work. And, and that's the reason we want to get these lines undergrounded so we don't have to do that anymore. That communications can be kept current even through storms and fires. Okay, thank you. That answers all the questions. Uh, the other, you had one more public comment. Yes, caller nineteen ninety nine. Your microphone is unmuted. Good afternoon. My name is James Ewing Whitman. I have been listening to most of these proceedings, although I've had to step away from my phone because I don't hold it. Um, you know the utilities underground and who's paying for stuff. I would like to think that everybody's best interest and in all this stuff is being done for safety reasons. There's a great deal of underground utility work that happened, started happening about a year ago, right when the lockdowns happened. But to help answer a gentleman who couldn't answer um, a question about Verizon putting power on the poles in 1996, an FCC Act number 702 was passed that made the only complaint that citizens or community members could make against these cell phone towers would be for how they looked. Um, and I think there was a misstatement, uh, somebody implying that PG&E has funds of like 500 million or maybe it was billion. Um, PG&E is owned by the Rothschilds and they're a $500 trillion corporation. So I just wanna say that I've been here listening. I've wanted to comment, there are several consent agenda items I would have liked to have commented on, but I just didn't have time. 
So have a good day, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. There are no other speakers, Chair. Chair, you're muted. Okay. Do we have a, a motion uh, for the to adopt a resolution declaring the six uh, Rule 28 project sites as separate utility districts? So moved, Coonerty. Second. The move is seconded. Please call the roll. Thank you. Supervisor Friend. Aye. I apologize. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Thank you. Coonerty. Aye. Caput. Aye. McPherson. Aye. Thank you. Motion passes unanimously. Okay. Uh, we go to uh, pride, number um, item number 11 has been deleted from today's agenda. Uh, item number 12 is to consider the final appointment of even, uh, I hope that's the way, even Simpson to the Commission on Justice and Gender as an enlarged representative of an organization re re representing the target population for a term to expire April 1st, 2024. Is there any public comment? There are no speakers to this item. Any, any comments from the board? I'll move to approve. Second. Move to, move to approve uh, Caput and Coonerty. Please call the roll. Thank you, Supervisor Friend. Aye. <laughs> Supervisor Koenig, I apologize. <laughs> it's all right. Friend can go first. Uh, but aye. Coonerty. Aye. Caput. Aye. McPherson. Aye. Thank you. Motion passes unanimously. Uh, item number 13 is to consider final uh, reappointments to at-large positions on the there's several commissions and committees here. The Childhood Advisory Council, Emergency Medical Care Com Commission, First Five Commission, Hazardous Materials Advisory Commission, In-Home Supportive Services Advisory Commission, Latino Affairs Commission, Mental Health Advisory Board, Mobile and Manufactured Home Commission, Santa Cruz Monterey Merced Managed Medical Care Commission and the Water Advisory Commission as outlined for terms to expire April 1st, 2025. And I would like to just make a note uh, to thank these individuals profusely for their commitment and dedication to serving on these committees and commissions. They're absolutely essential for us doing business in the county and it's very much appreciated. So thank you for your service and, uh, and for your continued service. Are there any comments uh, from board members or well, the public? I have no speakers for this item. Okay. Any comments from the uh, from the board from board members? Move approval. Okay. Um, do I have second? Second Koenig. Second Koenig. Please call the roll. Thank you, Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Friend. Aye. Coonerty. Aye. Caput. Aye. McPherson? Aye. Thank you. Motion passes unanimously. And, you know, I, I would uh, like to go th back to the consent items before we go to the um, uh, to our closed session, if we could. Uh, let's try to address those. Um, there, uh, number 13A is item number 25. That is to accept and file report on the all virtual Board of Supervisors meeting and continue to cut conduct an all Board of Supervisors public meetings using the all virtual model until the governor lifts the Brown Act, Brown Act exemptions due to the COVID-19 pandemic as recommended by the county administrative officers. officer. We had some comments from the public about their concerns. If you, we, those are on record, you do not have to repeat them. Um, but uh, I think Mr. Coney wanted to address this uh, item number 25. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, my concern was, as I said, in the uh, with the second recommended action to uh, continue virtual meetings until such time as the governor um, re removes the uh, the Brown Act um, waiver. In reviewing uh, ex the order, which is N twenty nine twenty, it says that all of the foregoing provisions, which which include the um, waivers mentioned. Uh, concerning the conduct of public meetings shall apply only during the period in which state or local public health officials have imposed or recommended social distancing measures. And so my concern is that, you know, recommending social distancing measures could continue for a, a great deal of time, uh, you know, possibly indefinitely. So I don't know that the governor would actually actively um, 
revoke this order so much as let it expire at such time um, as as it expires because we're no longer social distancing, but that could be a very long time indeed. So, you know, we've seen throughout this meeting, um, you know, chair your own challenges in connecting, uh, considerable challenge and delay um, in conducting the all virtual board meetings. Uh, members of the public have, as, as mentioned, not been able to see slides. And personally, I had trouble following item nine a little bit when the presenter's audio was cutting in and out. So my proposed uh, amendment to item 25 would be uh, in to, um, let me see here, strike out the part of recommend, the second recommended action. So strike out the governor lifts the Brown Act exemptions due to the COVID-19 pandemic and add the county of Santa Cruz meets all health metrics so as to be better than state defined minimal or yellow tier risk level. So in layman's terms, once we have moved through the orange tier, moved through the yellow tier, um, either out of any tier risk tier whatsoever or into a yet to be defined green tier by the state um, that we at that time would uh, move back to hybrid meetings. Okay, good. Um, a lot of discussion on this before. Any uh, other comments from the board members? Um, yes, Mr. Chair. Mr. Palacios, by the way, did you have any uh, presentation or words on this before board members continue to speak on this? Um, yes, just um, very briefly. Um, we did uh, conduct in-person meetings for nine months during the, um, during the period of the pandemic. And we were the only um, uh, jurisdiction of the cities. Uh, all the cities went completely virtual and we were the only one that, that had those meetings. And we were able to do it. Uh, we imposed a lot of safety regulations. Unfortunately, in the fall, we began to have uh, people who were coming to the meeting who refused to comply with the mask order. So we had people who were taking off their masks during the meeting. We had people in the hallways, uh, as many as 30 people in the hallways at one meeting who refused to put on masks. Uh, we started, we had one sheriff deputy, we started bringing in two sheriff deputies. At one meeting, we had four sheriff deputies. Uh, so that was the only, that's the only caution I would, I would put is that um, that's why uh, I recommended in January. So we had been all in person from March all the way through the end of the calendar year. But in, again, in the fall, uh, we were seeing systematically people coming to the meeting with the intention of trying to disrupt the meeting by removing their face masks, unfortunately. And so that's why um, it began to be too difficult to enforce. We were having to interrupt every meeting, constantly telling people to put their mask back on. So that's the only reason that I uh, recommended in January that we go to an all virtual format. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to bring that background. And then I, I wanted to ask a question, uh, Supervisor Kona, just to be clear. So you're recommending that your amendment is that when we come out of the yellow tier, or when we enter yellow tier, out of yellow tier. So it, for the better, right? Not not to move into orange, but to yeah, be out of yellow tier. That you know, the state may have to find a green tier by then. We may just be in the clear, so to speak. Okay, just wanted to make understand. Thank you. Okay. Well, Mr. Chair, um, yeah, I mean, I have some some brief comments. I, I understand actually what Supervisor Koenig is stating. I, I don't share um, the same concerns. I think that we should maintain. The language as it is and, and for that matter the board would have flexibility still to adjust that moving forward in advance of any sort of governor's action this isn't an action that precludes the board from ever taking a future action we still would have that kind of flexibility i, I know that the legislature is also um looking at um requiring local governments to have a virtual element to their meetings anyway it's unclear what the exact language on that will, may be we may end up in a hybrid format uh, due to some state legislation anyway. Um, so I'm, I'm comfortable with maintaining this as as is, and especially considering the fact that it can be re-explored again at a point moving forward. Um, while we are doing very well right now, and we're moving up toward the tiers that you had mentioned, Supervisor Koenig, we've also, uh, while it is different now with vaccines, we have also been here before and backslid before. So uh, one of the concerns I would have would be moving a little too swiftly into something we haven't seen, um, as the staff report indicated, and for that matter, serving on the board 
for not, almost nine years now, I, I've seen this to be the case as well. I haven't seen any sort of reduction in participation in the, in the meetings. Um, and in fact, I've actually seen a lot of new people participating, which is good. And so um, I, I haven't felt the same uh, reduction in access. But I, I do share that the overall um, sentiment that at some point, I mean, this isn't an indefinite proposal, at some point the board and, and all local governments will move back to that format. I just think that that um, the language that's presented here is actually the best language for us. So I, I won't, um, I, I respect what you're presenting, but I won't, I won't be uh, supporting a, an amendment to the to the regular motion, I'll just be uh, supporting the recommended actions. Did you want to make a substitute motion at this point, or do you want to wait to hear any other comments from board members? Well, since we pulled this we, item, we'll need an opportunity for the community that hasn't yeah. already spoken on the item to, right. to speak again at that point. Uh, whenever a motion okay. is introduced, I can introduce one or not. Very good. Any other comments from board members? Just, uh, this is Supervisor Coonerty. Very briefly, um, I, I appreciate Supervisor Koning's statements, uh, and you know, I think we will move back. I, I, there's one thing we learned from COVID is that uh, we don't we don't always know what's going to happen in the coming days, weeks, and months. And I'd rather um, not set unrealistic expectations. The second part is uh, we still have you know lots of county staff that we need to participate in this meeting, and so far uh, those who have kids are only back in school a couple days a week. And so uh, them being, you know, uh, they may need to be home for childcare. There's, there's just a lot of uncertainty right now. And before we start moving forward, uh, I'd like to, to have things to, to see where we are uh, from a health perspective and sort of from a return to normalcy perspective and then, and then make a decision. Uh, so I'd, super, I'd support uh, the staff recommendation. Uh, any, any other comments, uh, Supervisor Caput? No, I, I, uh, the only comment I'd say is I think we're all looking forward to the day when we're able to do all this in person. Uh, I'm, my con only concern is I hate to say, yeah, let's go. Uh, we're going to be in person, and then we say stop, and we're going to go back to virtual. Uh, we've been uh, we've had a problem uh, like in different areas of this whole crisis where we say go ahead we're opening up and then we say oh no we got to shut everything down and then we say go ahead i'd rather see this through right now and when we do actually go back to uh in person and everything that we're ready to go and stay with it okay see so okay any other questions Fair, I'll just respond briefly to um, sure. my colleagues' points. Um, I will point out, first of all, as far as the, the concerns about uh, moving too quickly or some kind of stop-start action, uh, I do think that tying it to getting out of the yellow tier uh, and into you know, green tier or, or in the clear, as I said, does you know, basically meet that qualification that uh, we will have you know, less than minimal risk as defined by the state, less than minimal risk. Um, and, you know, to the other point that Supervisor Friend made um, about possibly hybrid meetings coming um, and concern about specific staff members was also raised. Um, I actually do think that we should continue with a hybrid model uh, going forward. Um, it, it, it might be required by our state legislature, but ultimately I think it, um, we've seen it uh, is it's one of the benefits, one of the silver linings of the entire pandemic is uh, enabling more people to participate using a digital aspect. Um, and so part of the reason that I think we should act a little bit more proactively uh, than, than waiting for this, you know, social distancing to, um, to end completely is that, uh, you know, obviously it'll be a little challenging re uh, to move forward with that hybrid model. And, um, you know, I think the sooner the better. Okay, thank you. Any uh, comments from the public? Yes, I have one speaker, caller four. Your microphone is in mute. Hi, uh, this is Marilyn Garrett. This should have been on the regular agenda for full uh, discussion. I see the lockdown and virtual meetings as basically anti-democratic. The public is becoming more and more restricted and muted. Uh, 
Uh, and the, we've for years had meetings in public where we actually meet with our representatives who are supposed to represent us. And I find this um, very disturbing. And you're talking about disrupting the meetings by not wearing masks. Uh, so since you're talking about masks, I want to refer you to the highwire.com and the facts that uh, viruses are an essential part of life. There are millions and trillions. They go through everything. And I saw a clip from people making masks in a third world sweatshop, these blue masks all stacked up and on the floor, and pictures of nanoparticles being broken off. They're made from melted plastic, highly unhealthy and dangerous to the lungs. We need meetings in person. We need three-minute comments like we've had. This is going the way of a totalitarian society under the cloak of COVID cover. Thank you. There are no, I'm sorry, caller 1999, your microphone is unmuted. Good afternoon, this is James Ewing Whitman. Um, I like what Marilyn said. Uh, it would be great if we could meet every two weeks uh, in person, whatever that would mean, uh, what, it, what the state is dictating as far as when that can happen. That doesn't seem like it's going to happen. Um, oh, you know, that's just enough. It's just interesting to see what's going on here and what is all the things that are not being discussed because, wow, there's a tremendous amount of things that are not being discussed. Thank you. There are no other speakers to this item, Chair. Okay, I'll return it to the board then. Um, we, well, I don't, we don't have formally a motion uh, at this point. I, I, um, I don't mind uh, Supervisor Koenig's suggestion, but I think that uh, there's been so much change and going back and forth. I'd like to just stick with the, um, what we have is recommended by the CAO at this point. Uh, surely be open to, uh, Revisit this in the near future if, if necessary. I think we're on the right track as we as we speak. But uh, I would uh, I would go along with what is recommended by the CAO. Well, it uh, it doesn't sound like there's a second, but just for the sake of process, I would uh, move the uh, recommended actions with the amendment proposed um, to. Uh, strike out the Governor of the Brown Act exemption through the COVID-19 pandemic and add the county of Santa Cruz meets all health metrics to be better than the state defined minimal or yellow tier risk level. Okay. The motion's on the floor. Is there a second? Okay. It dies for a lack of a second. So then we do need a motion to approve uh, number 25 as presented. Chair, I'll move the recommended actions for item 25. And I'll, I'll second that. It's been moved and seconded. Um, please call the roll. Supervisor Koenig? No. Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Thank you. Motion passes with majority. Okay, four to one. Uh, we will move to item number 54. And this is a long one. <laughs> Approve amendment to agreement with Community Action Board to increase the total multi-year amount to $2,485,190 for emergency payment program services. Approve agreements with Housing Matters in the amount of $2,969,763 to provide emergency rehousing services. With Adobe Services in the amount of $3,228,251 to provide emergency rehousing services. And with Adobe Services in the amount of $1,200,000 to help secure housing opportunities for rapid rehousing and scattered site permanent supportive housing participants. Adopt resolution accepting $6,198,014 in unanticipated revenue from the Federal Emergency Solution Grant 
Court of Rives Re Relief Act adopt resolution accepting $1,900,000 from the State Homeless Housing Assistance and Prevention Program to fund rehousing services to take related actions as re recommended by the Director of Human Services. Um, I just might say, uh, if people don't think we're doing a lot about housing, this is almost $10 million worth of programs to uh, help those uh, in, in other emergency services. So um, it's quite a package. Uh, who would like to comment on this um, to begin? Sure. Super, oh, Supervisor, is it Coonerty or Koenig? I think it was Coonerty. I'm not sure. It was Supervisor Koenig who uh, pulled the item. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to comment on the reasons why I thought the item should be pulled. Um, to your point, Chair, uh, it's you know over $8 million. It's a significant amount of money. And I do want to point out that there was significant uh, frustration in our community the last time we saw an amount of money this large uh, with the HEAP and CASH funding for homelessness back in 2019, and ultimately the way that those funds uh, were allocated. And so immediately upon seeing this item, I was uh, a little cautious to see that we were accepting $8 million and immediately allocating it uh, in, in the same action. And specifically, I'm hesitant to allocate all $8 million to rapid rehousing, specifically because I'm deeply uh, dubious that we'll be able to, that just throwing money at this problem into uh, housing navigators is going to actually create the housing supply. As we all know, our, our community is, uh, by some measures, the fourth most expensive in the entire world at this point. Uh, there's a, a deep, deep housing shortage. Um, you know, I recently reviewed the, uh, the housing survey that of uh, CZU fire survey of unmet housing needs from the 7th of January. And uh, combined, there was um, over 200 respondents to this. And we saw that of owners who had lost their home, homeowners who had lost their home in the CZU fires, uh, only 12% are now renting an apartment or house. And of renters who had lost their home, uh, only 9% have been able to find a rental uh, or apartment. So, you know, roughly 10% of people who lost their homes from the CZU fires are now in, a, in another rental. Um, and many are still, you know, 30% living with family or friends um, or camping without shelter, 16%. So where, I just, where is the housing going to come from? I mean, just throwing money at a problem doesn't guarantee that we're going to fix it. So I, I did dive into the requirements of this funding a little bit. And so looking at the ESG CB2 funding um, guidelines, it specifies that it's for rapid rehousing uh, or emergency shelter. And while the state does place an emphasis on rapid rehousing, I would say we know our community the best. We're the ones on the front lines. Um, and ultimately, it's our responsibility to make sure that uh, these, this taxpayer money is invested as wisely as possible. And I should say, just that. We, ideally, we invest some portion of it, not just spend it. Currently, we're spending it. If, if you look at the budget proposals for these various contracts, uh, only about half of the contracts are actually going to helping people with housing. The other half is going to staffing costs. We're staffing up over 20 new positions. So I'd much rather be paying people who are uh, building housing um, or for housing supply itself rather than paying a bunch of people sitting behind desks, helping people look for housing that simply doesn't exist. Now, I do want to highlight a couple of concerns and specific issues as well. Uh, in the ESG CB2 funding uh, document, it, it outlines that only 3.2% of uh, grant funding should be spent on administration. Whereas if you total the amount uh, in these various contracts, um, so for example, um, I believe it's, close to, uh, here we go, administrative expenses in at least the Housing Matters contract are 258,000 out of uh, 3.2 million. So that's 8%. So I'm curious if, if these contracts even meet the guidelines um, of, of the grant funding itself, since we're spending 8% on administrative expensive expenses instead of 3%. Um, I find, you know, I, I would just a couple more things. Um, you know, some of the folks receiving this funding have actually never undertaken rehousing efforts of this size. Uh, so Housing Matters has done, to my understanding, some work 
uh, doing rapid rehousing with transition age youth, um, but never this many clients. Um, a, a, a BOD has, uh, if I understand correctly, never worked in our county before. We offered them $600,000 of the HEAP cash funds, which they ultimately chose not to accept because they didn't figure it was a sufficient amount of funding. Um, so they don't have any direct experience working in our county, but I accept they might have experience in other counties. But again, uh, we're pretty much a leader as far as an unaffordable housing market. Um, so those are some of my concerns. You know, ultimately, I think that we should um, delay uh, at least uh, or defer at least until the next meeting um, a decision on at least some of these contracts. Uh, I'd be open to moving forward with one or maybe two, but um, certainly not all of them. I, I would be very hesitant to, uh, or really don't think we should allocate all of the money to rapid rehousing for the reasons outlined. And uh, I would much rather see some allocation of spending on emergency shelter, which, as I've said, uh, is allowable uh, as far as my reading of the ESG CB2 grant. Um, and just to put it in perspective, I mean, let's say we spend half of this money that we have, $4 million out of $8 million, on uh, on shelters uh, or some kind of emergency shelter, we could literally go and buy uh, 880 pallet shelters, 880. I mean, granted, that's not the be all and end all of housing, but um, it's certainly a, a big step up over nothing. We could house everyone who is out here in San Lorenzo Park in one of these uh, pallet shelters. And of course, there's other communities of, of people experiencing homelessness. And I, I would actually like to uh, call attention again to the speaker from uh, Carol, Ms. Carol Bjorn, uh, who spoke at public comment this morning, calling out the fire that was started in North Rodeo Gulch uh, just on Sunday. If this had been a drier time of year, that fire could have been catastrophic. And we know that uh, many camping fires have, have uh, caused problems. We, we had the Paradise Park uh, fire not so long ago. And so I think as we move into the dry season, you know, it's not just, uh, it's not just the rapid rehousing of folks who are already in shelter. There's still, uh, there is still a huge gap of folks that are sheltered at all. And I think that that's an excellent justification for spending some of this funding on emergency shelter. I would love to see us have an alternative a, a alternative location where people can go so that the sh sheriff can effectively deal with homeless encampments in North Rodeo Gulch. We can get people out of those high fire zones and reduce fire risk. Uh, I think uh, that's everything I wanted to say. Oh, actually one more point. Um, the ESG CV2 funding does also say that you can spend up to $2.5 million on uh, some kind of real estate purchase or acquisition. Uh, and so that $2.5 million could be used for the acquisition of, uh, you know, along with, you know, Project Home Key, the acquisition of some kind of hotel as well. So again, all this is to say, I, I believe we should be investing some of this money rather than just spending it all, uh, that there is still a huge gap in emergency shelter within our community. And um, I do not believe that simply spending as much money on, as possible on rapid rehousing is going to yield the results that we're after. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know if uh, anyone from uh, Human Services would like to comment on that or any other board members. Any other board members want to comment on this? Uh, Chair McPherson, we have um, Robert Batner and uh, Randy Morris available to, to, to respond uh, Good. whenever you would like. Good. I, I think uh, let's have them respond. I think there's some legitimate questions. Um, I don't know, Mr. Morris or Ratner, who wants to. Speak first. Hi, Supervisor McPherson and members of the board. Uh, my name is Robert Ratner, and I'm happy to go first. I'm the new division director in the Housing for Health division and uh, appreciate the dialogue about the proposals. Uh, a few points of clarification. I'm not sure I'll address all of Supervisor Koenig's um, concerns in this first uh, round, but I'm happy to follow up with additional questions from other board members. Uh, first, I want to clarify that the emergency shelter grant coronavirus funds, we are using some of the money that's been allocated to pay for emergency shelter and to cover some of the cost of our COVID-19 homeless sheltering efforts. We've expanded with FEMA funding, CARES Act funding, and other dollars. Emergency shelter tremendously during the COVID pandemic. We've seen a growth of over 550 beds during the pandemic. 
And the funding that we've used to expand those sheltering programs will be coming to an end when the pandemic comes to an end. And we really need to work closely with our community partners, uh, folks who own property. And th there is property available um, within Santa Cruz County and neighboring uh, communities to help folks get into housing with right supports and rental assistance. Uh, so I guess point number one is we are using some of this ESG CV funding to pay for emergency shelter. Uh, we have to develop some strategies to help folks who are in our temporary shelters to get into permanent homes. Um, and from the perspective of our, our Housing for Healthy Santa Cruz framework, which the board adopted recently, I think our definition of housing is, is not one that includes pallet shelters is the ultimate goal. We're looking to help people get into places that meet um, federal, state, and local standards for housing that include um, having safe, secure physical locations with access to electricity, water, and sewage. Um, so I think we really need to reflect on our ultimate goal and kind of what kind of housing we're trying to get people into. Uh, rapid rehousing is one of the stated goals in the approved framework um, that the board adopted recently. We um, propose significantly increasing rapid rehousing programming, and this set of proposals will increase the number of slots by around 200 which actually still gives us a gap of 190 slots that the board had previously approved. Um, so I think if we're gonna be consistent with the framework we adopted, we should be moving forward to fill in some of those gaps. Um, emergency shelters are also a gap that we need to fill, um, but this particular funding source works well for rapid rehousing. I also wanna clarify that all of the funds are not specifically for rapid rehousing. The entire package contains a lot of different elements that are part of a rehousing wave to make sure we're not gonna return people back to the streets from our COVID-19 sheltering efforts. Included in the package is some flexible funding with the Community Action Board to help people with things they need to move into apartments um, or other types of living situation, household items, furniture, et cetera. There's a contract to partner with folks who have real estate in the community to help individuals who have housing vouchers or rapid rehousing subsidies to gain access to housing in the community. And uh, there's plenty of evidence from other counties in the state that have used this funding that rapid rehousing can and does work for many people experiencing homelessness, even in high cost communities. And I believe that's the case here in Santa Cruz. And uh, the item also refers to uh, a wonderful um, opportunity we have with the Housing Authority. They're providing us with 75 rental assistance subsidies specifically for homeless households in our existing Project Room Key COVID-19 sheltering efforts um, to help them get into housing with appropriate supports and services. And I, I would also say that many people experiencing homelessness, particularly those in our COVID-19 sheltering programs have significant health issues. We have people who are over 70 who are struggling with daily living challenges, like using the bathroom and getting dressed. And the supports that Supervisor Koenig refers to as not being necessary actually are an important part of the work we do to address homelessness. I think one of the things that's important to keep in mind in our framework is um, healthcare and providing wraparound supports to make sure people are able to get and keep housing. And for many people struggling with disabilities or functional impairments, it's those services that help them to get and keep housing that are a critical component in addition to reducing the cost of the housing. So I think I addressed many of the points that Supervisor Koenig raised. And I think I would end with, um, if we do not move forward with this uh, proposed package, which is fairly consistent with what federal and state technical assistance providers have recommended to communities throughout California, we'll be in jeopardy of having a large number of people who are staying in COVID shelters without anywhere to go. And we'll see a significant increase, I would anticipate, in the number of unsheltered people in the fall when we do not have formal authority to continue our FEMA-supported sheltering efforts. And uh, the community that I worked in before coming to Santa Cruz, um, they got started with a very similar effort many months um, earlier than we're getting started. And they've already helped 400 households get into permanent housing from their COVID-19 sheltering efforts. And it's uh, Alameda County, which is also a very expensive, high cost community.
Um, and I'm here as well. Uh, thank you, Robert, for covering all that. Um, there was one comment Supervisor Koenig made, and it's actually a question that I had, so it must be a question on many people's mind, and that was a reference to Abode, uh, which is one of the contract agencies. They actually, um, a yes and a no. The yes is Supervisor Koenig is correct. We did share with them that they applied for a grant in Santa Cruz County, and they stepped away from it, so that comment Supervisor Koenig made is correct, but I think it's important for the board and public to know they do have an existing service that they do provide in Watsonville, so they are existing provider in uh, Santa Cruz County, and this was a very carefully thought out proposal to spread the dollars around to not just one provider. It's a huge lift for one organization. So in direct dialogue with Housing Matters and Abode, a North and a South County provider and CAB, we put this together. Um, I do want to share what we shared with Supervisor Koenig yesterday, and I think it's important we figure out to have ongoing dialogue as staff with board members in this public about the statement that this is throwing money away, which Supervisor Koenig said, for those of us who work in the field, Robert for 30 years, me for 32 years. It's a comment we hear a lot because it looks like it's going to just people to do nothing. But for those of us who work very, very closely with this type of population on the ground, it's understandable that it seems that way, but we are asking for your board to consider it is the way with the categorical nature of this funding to help this population. And as Robert said, and I think it's worth highlighting, just around the corner from us, 400 people got moved out of COVID shelters into housing, which is not throwing money away. So I would have to respectfully disagree with Supervisor Koenig's comment, but I think it's important the board hears that and Supervisor Koenig, you hear that as well. There's some disconnect in our communication with you that you see it that way. So I hope we can keep working with you, keep answering your questions. And for the full board, we feel very confident this is the best thing we can do and urge you to vote for this. Any delay, I think, runs the risk for all of us having to confront a horizon where people are put on the streets because we are not bringing these soft skills and supports forward that we believe is the right package to help this population. Uh, any com comments from board members? Uh, don't see any. Uh, Supervisor McPherson, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yeah, yes. Uh, Supervisor um, sure. So um, first, I think um, I appreciate Supervisor Koning pulling this item. It's a big and important item, and it uh, warranted a further discussion. Uh, so I think that's that's beneficial. Um, I guess I'd say I I agree with Supervisor Koning on the fundamentals in that uh, we're an extremely expensive community with limited places for people to go. Um, one of my hopes is that with this sort of case management and housing navigation, we'll have an emphasis on trying to get people to places where they will be successful. And whether that's here in Santa Cruz County where they may have connections and family, or whether that's other communities where they may have uh, connections and family or may have an opportunity to, uh, to get more affordable housing or a section eight unit sooner than they otherwise would have. Um, I think that's where these navigators and caseworkers can play a really important role um, in going forward. Um, frankly, I like the idea of bringing in a new, although I take the point that they're operating in Wattsville, um, expanding the number of service providers we have uh, with these contracts uh, as a way to see who can be successful and what they can do. Um, I think it's a very big lift. Uh, and um, I think the one of the challenging things is that while uh, we're spending a lot of money, these are for the folks who are currently sheltered. Uh, we still have a large unsheltered population, which the which the uh, community and the people who are unsheltered are obviously suffering uh, from. And so we um, will need to see if this works as a model that then can be applied um, to our continuing crisis across this community. Okay, thank you, Mr. Coonerty. Um, any other comments from board members? Mr. Chair, I'll just briefly comment that I appreciate the work Dr. Ratner and Director Morris have been doing um, and how open they've been to answer questions by from me and my staff in advance of meetings to get a lot of these issues addressed. I have a lot of confidence in, in what this proposal is. I agree with Supervisor Koenig. It's, it is a lot of money, and this is a very complex, uh, challenging issue. But the reason that we brought in Dr. Radner, and the reason we brought in Director Morris in large part was because of their experiences addressing this in other locations, and we created a new division for this purpose. 
Um, I mean, this is an, in some respects can feel like an intractable problem, but I, I think that some of what they're proposing or what is being proposed is exactly right. It also comports with the legal components of, of the funding. Uh, obviously, all these items are reviewed by county council as well. I mean, to your questions on the legal side, you can be assured that these have been through that review. Um, but I'm supportive of the item and, and I'm prepared to move the recommended actions. Okay, let's see if there's any other. Uh, um, there, that's a motion. Um, I'll, I'll second that motion. Okay, any other comments from the board? Um, I'd, I'd like to um, just, um, I, I think these points are well taken because, and especially I'm, I'm a little concerned about this. Um, if I could make a comment um, about the, the amount spent on administration. Uh, is that a concern at all, or are we within the realm of what's specified in these grants? I guess that Mr. Morris or Mr. Ratner would be able to answer that. Yeah, I can answer that, Supervisor McPherson. As uh, Supervisor Friend indicated, this has been reviewed by County Council. We also had a state-funded technical assistance provider home base that reviewed the contract and gave us guidance on what's allowed. Um, and we're, we're within the bounds of um, guidance from them and the, the funding uh, authorities. Okay. All right. I, well, Supervisor I, I, McPherson. Yes. Um, I don't know technically if this is correct, but I think sometimes admin is a word. It's a semantics and what often gets missed is um, contracts aren't allowed to have a certain amount of administrative overhead, which is very different than administrative cost to pay for staff. So I'm imagining that that's the distance between Supervisor Koenig's 8% figure and whatever it is in the restrictions. Um, and but but yes, every single contract is reviewed by County okay. Council and back in advance. Good. Thank you for clarifying that. I appreciate that. Um, I, I would like to add, there's a motion and a second on the floor. I'd like to add that additional um, direction to have the uh, Housing for Health Office report back to the board uh, no later than I think August 2021 would be um, this next August um, with an update about the status of the rehousing wave, as we call it. Uh, Specifically, I'd be interested in uh, the number of people successfully moved into stable housing as a result of the program. Maybe you're going to be doing that anyway, but I'd like to make some have that as a specific uh, recommendation or direction added to the motion. And Supervisor McPherson, for you and the board, if this matters, a previous board action in the study session when uh, Dr. Ratner and I presented, we had asked for directive and you approved the director for us to return to you no later than the um, early August board hearing to give an update on the entire three-year plan and the first six-month work plan. Um, and as is our practice, we, uh, for big items like this, meet with your offices before big presentations. And whether you give directive today or you give us um, some recommendations as we meet with you in advance of that presentation, we can present anything that's of help to give you and the public an update on um, these contracts in particular, but in all the work we're doing. Okay. Um, well, I'd like to say, I think it will be done, but I'd like to specify that we get the uh, report back yeah, you know, in August, as you mentioned, it's great. It's in the works, so I think that's that's sufficient um, at this point. Chair, if I may uh, address both yes. your comment uh, as well as some of the comments by staff. Um, first of all, you know I fully agree we should be monitoring the progress uh, of this of this rehousing wave, so to speak. Um, my concern is that we may monitor the progress, but if we've already allocated all the money, what opportunities do we have to actually? Uh, you know, adjust these contracts or, or make do anything significantly different if we see that things are not going well, if we see that we're not able to successfully rehouse people as much, uh, as, much as we'd like. I would also uh, point out something that staff mentioned, which is these contracts, this $8 million will at best house about 200 people of more than 500 currently in county shelters. So there's still the gap. And part of what I see spending additional or, or some of the funds on emergency services or uh, shelter doing is providing that fail safe. If the money expires for FEMA run shelters, we would still have a fallback of some kind of shelter for people. You know, of course, a pallet shelter is not the be all and end all of housing. We all recognize that, but it's a heck of a lot better than the streets. And I would also like to reiterate that, you know, something about the Housing for Health Department. I mean, it's in the name. It is why we created a new division. 
housing for health. The best form of health care is housing. And while it's excellent and necessary to have wraparound services, you have to start with the roof over someone's head, a place where they can lock their things. So, uh, you know, I would say one thing you didn't hear from staff is any reason why we couldn't save some of this money for uh, emergency shelter, set, us, set it aside. You know, looking at the uh, expenditure schedule, we need to spend 20% of the funds by July 31st. I, I think we can still do that by approving either one of these contracts uh, or two of them, but not necessarily allocating all of the money today. I think we could also do it relatively quickly, but with an order for some kind of emergency shelter as well, which I'm happy to bring uh, back to the board at our next meeting. Um, I would also, you know, some questions for staff. Uh, you know, I, the, the property has been identified as available properties for people to rent. That's great. Um, I, I'd love to know more about where those are. It was mentioned that 75 units have been set aside by the housing authority. Well, great, that's 75 of 200. That sounds like pretty low hanging fruit. Why do we need to go spend $3 million on case managers if, you know, if, if we're significantly towards our goal already with just the allocation that the housing uh, authority has already set aside? So, you know, those are my questions. What do we do if this doesn't work? What do we do about the other 300 people? Why should we not create a fail safe option? Okay, I don't know if um, Mr. Morris or Ratner, I mean, I think you have a, you've spelled out your, the plan of attack, you've presented it to us. I don't know if you want to reiterate any part of that or if you would further answer the questions of Supervisor Koenig. Uh, Supervisor McPherson, I can um, provide a further clarification if the board is interested in that. Um, would you like me to respond to some of uh, those additional yeah, questions? Yeah, I think so. Yes, please. So I want to clarify that um, the partnership with the Housing Authority is 75 um, rental assistance vouchers for people who are between the ages of 18 and 61 um, who are disabled. And the vouchers are for an entire household. So a voucher doesn't mean one person. It's whoever is within that household with that individual. They're not specific units. It's rental assistance, and the rental assistance can be used in privately owned, either nonprofit or um, private uh, for profit entity rental housing. And so, folks who are struggling with homelessness need support to help find units in the community. Um, there, are, there are units in the community. We, in this community, through the Whole Person Care Program, have contracted with an agency to help people with housing vouchers to find housing units. It's been quite successful, much more successful than asking people experiencing homelessness to try to navigate a government program and find housing on their own without that kind of support. Um, the 75 vouchers are in addition to the 200 rapid rehousing slots. So that brings us closer to uh, 300 households. And of course, we want to help as many households as possible get into housing. Uh, I alluded to earlier that some of the ESG CV funding is being used to pay for emergency shelter. And there are other funding sources that we are using to pay for emergency shelter. Uh, I am working with other members of the board and city leaders to look at how we're going to fund emergency shelter um, after the pandemic. And I do think there is a legitimate issue for the community around how we fund and support emergency shelter long term. Most of the funding that the County of Santa Cruz has been using to support emergency or temporary housing programs has been based on one time state funding. And we have, as we indicated in our presentation to the board, a significant funding gap in many areas, including emergency shelter. Um, and this particular funding source creates a great opportunity for us to work on the long term goal for folks experiencing homelessness, which is helping people move from the streets and shelter into to permanent homes um, and not having shelter as the, the aspiration for the community. And uh, I do want to say that Supervisor Kling alluded to some funding that the community was involved with prior to these additional dollars, and that's the Homeless Emergency Assistance Program funds, which coincidentally was also around $10 million. The bulk of that funding was used to pay for emergency shelter programming, hygiene facilities, outreach, 
And the preliminary results we have from the use of that funding is we did not help a lot of people get into permanent housing and that funding is coming to an end. So we will be seeing some reductions in emergency shelter capacity that again was supported with one-time dollars. So um, I, I think that uh, for us in the division, our, our ultimate aim is helping people to get into long-term stable, healthy housing that's that's not shelter and we we believe that these recommendations are going to help us to make a significant impact um in the community and we'll build out our system in a way that's consistent with what we laid out for the board and other community members in the strategic framework and, and i would like to just piggyback with a question back to you dr ratner i i might have misheard you supervisor koenig but i heard you say why money purpose towards what robert just explained is of interest rather than a fail safe i'm, I'm not following what your point is about fail safe um because we don't see if there was a fail safe solution with these monies counties and communities wouldn't have homelessness the question i'm wondering if would be helpful to your board um robert the comments are like all this money is being thrown away and sent to staff but i don't think i heard you speak to how much of it is purpose to the side to help with rental assistance to bridge the gap between um, market rate costs because that doesn't require building housing or getting tiny homes or getting shelters it's it is an immediate um, fix and maybe we didn't speak to that well enough in the board memo or in our answers to the board questions because that's a chunk of the money that is the bridge well if i may clarify um what I, what I meant by a fail safe is, is precisely the Dr. Ratner's point just now, which is um, there's a legitimate need for money for shelters, which is because of what we have is going away. And so when I talk about an expenditure on emergency shelter, I'm not talking about, um, you know, paying for a hotel room. I'm talking about an investment that counts as emergency shelter, something like a pallet shelter or a Conestoga hut. You know, one of the great things about pallet shelters is they collapse. They can be stored easily. They can be moved around. They could be used in uh, emergency response in our county in the future. Should say, I don't know, we see flooding in a low-lying area or another fire. Um, so we have an opportunity to build real capacity in our community to deal with sheltering um, and emergency situations. And so when I say a fail-safe, I mean, what happens if... We don't successfully house 200, 275 people or, or households. Uh, what happens when the money runs out to keep them in rental housing? Because after all, this program is only tracking people for two years. So what if they can't successfully stay in the housing and, and we don't have money for that? Um, and what happens when the rest of our shelter money dries up? And we've made absolutely no investment. I mean, we're simply saying we'll solve that problem in the future. Why not make some investment in solving it now? Can I, uh, can I ask a, to sort of sure. maybe try to move us forward a little bit, which is, uh, it's my understanding that there is, that, that there's some of the housing support funds, if, if this program is not successful and doesn't find housing um, for, for a percentage of this population, there will be housing support funds left over um, from this allocation that then could be repurposed for a variety of strategies to help with either that population or other populations. And I'm wondering if between approving this and our, you know, and future meetings and certainly before August, if we could have more discussions about what, how we could repurpose those if, if, if we don't hit the numbers that we need to hit. And I just want to confirm that's correct with Dr. Ratner or, or Director Morris? So um, the question, Supervisor Cooney, as I understand it is, um, and uh, Randy alluded to this as well, how much of the proposed rapid rehousing contract is actually for rental assistance? So um, in general, the budgets for the programs are around $24,000 per household to help be a bridge um, to help them land in an affordable place and increase their income over time so they would be able to sustain that project, I'm sorry, that housing um, at the end of the term of the program. And the money would only be used to your question, Supervisor Coonerty, if people actually have housing to move into. So if it turns out that there is not an opportunity that works for someone, that money would still be available. And all of our contracts in human services allow for us to 
terminate with appropriate notification and communication with our providers. Don't expect we'll need to do that in this particular case, um, but there is always that option. Um, and uh, we, we can update the board on the status um, as you suggested, or actually Supervisor McPherson in August and where we are with the projects once they're up and running. Okay. Any other comments from the board? Uh, we have not received uh, or opened it for public comment yet. Uh, we need to do that. Is there, is there anybody that would like to address this from the public? We currently see no speakers to this item. Okay. I will return it to the board. Um, there is a motion on the floor in a second, uh, and I think it, you, you accepted the additional direction that we, they would get a report back in August. Is that correct? Um, I will. I will now. I'll move the. Uh, <laughs> <Very good. laughs> I'll add. So I'll move the recommended actions um, with the additional direction for the report back. And okay. I think Supervisor Coonerty had seconded that. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yes. Okay. You're you okay with that. Yeah. Okay. We we have a, a motion with additional direction. Um, please call the roll. Yes, hey, Supervisor Koenig. No. Friend. Aye. Coonerty. Aye. Caput. Aye. McPherson. Aye. Thank you. Motion passes with the majority. Uh, that completes our agenda. Uh, we have three closed session items. Uh, I don't know what the pleasure of the board is. It is 1.15, just after 1.15. Would you like to take an hour break and then come back for the closed session, or do you want to uh, take a 10-minute break and go into closed session? Let's hey. take a 10-minute break and then get it done. Okay. Does anybody object to that? That's what my preference would be. Uh, we'll take a 10-minute break, uh, get, get back at 1.30. Um, is there, are there any reportable items coming from the closed session? No, there are no reportable items. Okay. Then we will recess, uh, we'll close the regular board meeting and go into closed session and return at 1.30 in about 15 minutes. Thank you.